The American Scholar by Ralph Waldo Emerson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Daniel Christopher June. Mr. President and Gentlemen, I greet you on the recommencement of our literary year. Our anniversary is one of hope and, perhaps, not enough of labor. We not meet for games of strength or skill, for the recitation of histories, tragedies, and odes like the ancient Greeks, for parliaments of love and poesy like the troubadours, nor for the advancement of science like our contemporaries in the British and European capitals. Thus far, our holiday has been simply a friendly sign of the survival of the love of letters among a people too busy to give to letters any more. As such, it is precious as a sign of an indestructible instinct. Perhaps the time has already come when it ought to be, and will be, something else, when the sluggard intellect of this continent will look from under its iron lids and fill the postponed expectation of the world with something better than the exertions of mechanical skill. Our day of dependence, our long apprenticeship to the learning of other lands, draws to a close. The millions that around us are rushing into life cannot always be fed on the sere remains of foreign harvests. Events, actions arise, that must be sung, that will sing themselves. Who can doubt that poetry will revive and lead in a new age, as the star in the constellation harp, which now flames in our zenith, astronomers announce, shall one day be the pole star for a thousand years? In this hope, I accept the topic which not only usage, but the nature of our association seems to prescribe to this day, the American scholar. Year by year we come up hither to read one more chapter of his biography. Let us inquire what light new days and events have thrown on this character and his hopes. It is one of those fables which, out of an unknown antiquity, convey an unlooked-for wisdom that the gods in the beginning divided man into men, that he might be more helpful to himself, just as the hand was divided into fingers, the better to answer its end. The old fable covers a doctrine, ever new and sublime, that there is one man, present to all particular men only partially, or through one faculty, and that you must take the whole society to find the whole man. Man is not a farmer, or a professor, or an engineer, but he is all. Man is priest, and scholar, and statesman, and producer, and soldier. In the divided or social state, these functions are parceled out to individuals, each of whom aims to do his stint of the joint work whilst each other performs his. The fable implies that the individual, to possess himself, must sometimes return from his own labors to embrace all the other labors. But unfortunately, this original unit, this fountain of power, has become so distributed to multitudes, has been so minutely subdivided and peddled out, that it is spilled into drops, and cannot be gathered. The state of society is one in which the members have suffered amputations from the trunk, and strut about so many walking monsters a good finger, a neck, a stomach, an elbow, but never a man. Man is thus metamorphosed into a thing, into many things. The planter, who is man sent out into the field to gather food, is seldom cheered by any idea of the true dignity of his ministry. He sees his bushel and his cart, and nothing beyond. He sinks into the farmer instead of man on the farm. The tradesman scarcely ever gives an ideal worth to his work, but is ridden by the routine of his craft, and the soul is subject to dollars. The priest becomes a form, the attorney a statute book, the mechanic a machine, the sailor a rope of a ship. In this distribution of functions, the scholar is the delegated intellect, and the right state he is man-thinking. In the degenerate state, when the victim of society, he tends to become a mere thinker, or still worse, a parrot of other man's thinking. In this view of him, as man-thinking, the theory of his office is contained. Him nature solicits with all her placid, all her monetary pictures. Him the past instructs. Him the future invites. Is not, indeed, every man a student, and do not all things exist for the student's behoof? And finally, is not the true scholar the only true master? But the old oracle said, all things have two handles. Beware the wrong one. In life, too often, the scholar errs with mankind and forfeits his privilege. Let us see him in his school, and consider him in reference to the main influences he receives. 1. The first in time, and the first in importance of the influence upon the mind, is that of nature. Every day the sun, and after sunset, night, and her stars. Ever the wind blows, ever the grass grows. Every day men and women conversing, beholding, and beholden. The scholar is he of all men whom this spectacle most engages. He must settle its value in his mind. What is nature to him? 
There is never a beginning, there is never an end to the inexplicable continuity of this web of God, but always circular power returning into itself. Therein it resembles his own spirit, whose beginning, whose ending he can never find, so entire, so boundless. Far too, as her splendor shines, system on system, shooting like stars, upward, downward, without center, without circumference, in the mass and in the particle, nature hastens to render account of herself to the mind. Classification begins. To the young mind, everything is individual, stands by itself. By and by it finds how to join two things, and see in them one nature, then three, then three thousand. And so, tyrannized over by its own unifying instinct, it goes on tying things together, diminishing anomalies, discovering roots running underground, whereby contrary and remote things cohere, and flower out from one stem. It presently learns that since the dawn of history there has been a constant accumulation and classifying of facts. But what is classification but the perceiving that these objects are not chaotic, and are not foreign, but have a law which is also a law of the human mind? The astronomer discovers that geometry, a pure abstraction of the human mind, is the measure of planetary motion. The chemist finds proportions and intelligible method throughout matter, and science is nothing but the finding of analogy, identity in the most remote parts. The ambitious soul sits down before each refractory fact. One after another reduces all strange constitutions, all new powers to their class and their law, and goes on forever to animate the last fiber of organization, the outskirts of nature, by insight. Thus to him, to this schoolboy under the bending dome of day, is suggested that he and it proceed from one root. One is leaf and one is flower, relations sympathy stirring in every vein. And what is that root? Is not that the soul of his soul, a thought too bold, a dream too wild? Yet when the spiritual light shall have revealed the law of more earthly natures, when he has learned to worship the soul, and to see that the natural philosophy that now is, is only the first gropings of his gigantic hand, he shall look forward to an ever-expanding knowledge as to a becoming creator. He shall see that nature is the opposite of the soul, answering to it part for part. One is seal, the other is print. Its beauty is the beauty of his own mind. Its laws are the laws of his own mind. Nature then becomes to him the measure of his attainments. So much of nature as he is ignorant of, so much of his own mind does he not yet possess. And in fine, the ancient precept, know thyself, and the modern precept, study nature, become at last one maxim. 2. The next great influence into the spirit of the scholar is the mind of the past. In whatever form, whether of literature, of art, of institutions, that mind is inscribed, Books are the best type of the influence of the past, and perhaps we shall get get at the truth. Learn the amount of this influence more conveniently, by considering their value alone. The theory of books is noble. The scholar of the first age received into him the world around, brooded thereon, gave it a new arrangement in his mind, and uttered it again. It came into him life. It went from him truth. It came to him short-lived actions. It went from him immortal thoughts. It came to him business. It went from him poetry. It was dead fact. Now it is quick thought. It can stand, and it can go. It now endures, it now flies, it now inspires. Precisely in proportion to the depth of mind from which it is ensued, so high does it soar, so long does it sing. Or, I might say, it depends on how far the process has gone of transmuting life into truth. In proportion to the completeness of the distillation, so will the purity and perishableness of the product be. But none is quite perfect. As no air pump can by any means make a perfect vacuum, so neither can any artist entirely exclude the conventional, the local, the perishable from his book, or write a book of pure thought that shall be as efficient in all respects to remote posterity as to contemporaries, or rather to the second age. Each age, it is found, must write its own books, or rather, each generation for the next succeeding. The book of an older period will not fit this. Yet hence arises a grave mischief. The sacredness which attaches to the act of creation, the act of thought, is transferred to the record. The poet Channing was felt to be a divine man. Henceforth, the chant is also divine. The writer was a just and wise spirit. Henceforth, it is settled. The book is perfect. So love of the hero corrupts into worship of his statue. Instantly, the book becomes noxious. The guide is a tyrant. The sluggish and perverted mind of the multitude, slow to open to the incursions of reason, having once so opened, having once received the book, stands upon it, and makes an outcry if it is disparaged. Colleges are built on it. Books are written on it by thinkers, not by man thinking. By men of talent, that is, who start wrong, who set out from accepted dogmas, not from their own sight of principles. 
Meek young men grew up in libraries, believing it their duty to accept the views which Cicero, which Locke, which Bacon have given, forgetful that Cicero, Locke, and Bacon were only young men in libraries when they wrote those books. Hence, instead of man thinking, we have the bookworm. Hence, the book-learned class, who value books as such, not as related to nature and the human constitution, but as making a sort of third estate with the world and the soul. Hence the resorters of readings, the emendators, the bibliomaniacs of all degrees. Books are the best of things, well used, abused, among the worst. What is the right use? What is the one end which all means go to effect? They are for nothing but to inspire. I had better never see a book than to be warped by its attraction clean out of my orbit and made a satellite instead of a system. The one thing in the world of value is the active soul. This every man is entitled to. This every man contains within himself, although, in almost all men, obstructed and, as yet, unborn. The soul active sees absolute truth, and utters truth, or creates. In this action, it is genius. Not the privilege of here and there our favorite, but the sound estate of every man. In its essence, it is progressive. The book, the college, the school of art, the institutions of any kind, stop with some past utterance of genius. This is good, say they. Let us hold by this. They pin me down. They look backwards and not forward. But genius looks forward. The eyes of man are set in his forehead, not in his hindhead. Man hopes. Genius creates. Whatever talents may be, if the man create not, the pure efflux of the deity is not his. Cinders and smoke there may be, but not yet flame. There are creative manners. There are creative actions and creative words. Manners, actions, words, that is, indicative of no custom or authority, but springing spontaneous to the mind's own sense of good and fair. On the other hand, instead of being its own seer, let it receive from another mind its truth, though it were in torrents of light, without periods of solitude, inquest, and self-recovery, and a fatal disservice is done. Genius is always sufficiently the enemy of genius by over-influence. Literature of every nation bears with me witness. The English dramatic poets have Shakespeareized now for two hundred years. Undoubtedly there is a right way of reading, so it be sternly subordinated. Man thinking must not be subdued by his instruments. Books are for the scholar's idle times. When he can read God directly, the hour is too precious to be wasted in other man's transcripts of their readings. But when the intervals of darkness come, as come they must, when the sun is hid and the stars withdraw their shining, we repair to the lamps which were kindled by their ray, to guide our steps in the east again, where the dawn is. We hear that we may speak. The Arabian proverb says, A fig tree, looking on a fig tree, becomes fruitful. It is remarkable the character of the pleasure we derive from the best books. They impressed us with the conviction that one nature wrote and the same reads. We read the verses of one of the great English poets, of Chaucer, of Marvel, of Dryden, with the most modern joy. With the pleasure, I mean, that is in great part caused by the abstraction of all time from the verses. There is some awe mixed with the joy of our surprise when this poet, who lived in some past world two or three hundred years ago, says that which lies close to my own soul, that which I also had well nigh thought and said. For if the evidence thence afforded to the philosophical doctrine of the identity of all souls, we should suppose some pre-established harmony, some foresight of souls that were to be, and some preparation of stores for their future wants, like the fact observed in insects, who lay up food before death for the young grub they shall never see. I would not be hurried by any love of system, by any exaggeration of instincts, to underrate the book. We all know that, as the human body can be nourished on any food, though it were boiled grass and the broth of shoes, so the human mind can be fed by any knowledge. And great and heroic men have existed, who have almost no other information than by the printed page. I only would say that it needs a strong head to bear that diet. One must be an inventor to read well. As the proverb says, he that would bring home the wealth of the Indies must carry out the wealth of the Indies. There is then creative reading as well as creative writing. When the mind is braced by labor and invention, the page of whatever book we read becomes luminous with manifold illusion. Every sentence is doubly significant, and the sense of our author is as broad as the world. We then see what is always true, that as the seer's hours of vision is short and rare among heavy days and months, so is its record, perchance, the least part of his volume. The discerning will read, in his Plato or Shakespeare, only the least part, only the authentic utterances of the oracle. All the rest he rejects, were it never so many times Plato's or Shakespeare's. Of course, there is a portion of reading quite indispensable to a wise man. History and exact science he must learn by laborious reading. Colleges, in like manner, have their indispensable office, to teach elements. 
but they can only highly serve us when they aim not to drill but to create when they gather from afar every ray of various genius to their hospitable halls and by the concentrated fires set the hearts of their youth on flame thought and knowledge are natures in which apparatus and pretension avail nothing gowns and pecuniary foundations though of towns of gold can never countervail the least sentence or syllable of wit forget this and our american colleges will recede in their public importance whilst they grow richer every year three there goes in the world a notion that the scholar should be a recluse a valetudinarian as unfit for any handwork or public labor as a penknife or an axe the so-called practical men sneer at speculative men as if because they speculate or see they could do nothing i have heard it said that the clergy who are always more universally than any other class of scholars of their day are addressed as women that the rough spontaneous conversation of men they do not hear but only a mincing and diluted speech they are often virtually disfranchised and indeed they are advocates for their celibacy as far as this is true for the studious class it is not just and wise action is with the scholar subordinate but it is essential without it he is not yet man without it thought can never ripen into truth whilst the world hangs before the eye as a cloud of beauty we cannot even see its beauty inaction is cowardice but there can be no scholar without the heroic mind the preamble of thought the transition through which it passes from the unconscious to the conscious is action only so much do i know as i have lived instantly we know whose words are loaded with life and whose not the world this shadow of the soul or other me lies wide around its attractions are the keys which unlock my thoughts and make me acquainted with myself i run eagerly into this resounding tumult i grasp the hands of those around me and take my place in the ring to suffer and to work taught by an instinct that so shall the dumb abyss be vocal with speech i pierce its order i dissipate its fear i dispose of it within the circuit of my expanding life so much only of life as i know by experience so much of the wilderness have i vanquished and planted or so far have i extended my being my dominion i do not see how any man can afford for the sake of his nerves and his nap to spare any action in which he can partake it is pearls and rubies to his discourse drudgery calamity exasperation want are instructors in eloquence and wisdom the true scholar grudges every opportunity of action passed by as a loss of power it is the raw materials out of which the intellect moulds her splendid products a strange process too this by which experience is converted into thought as a mulberry leaf is converted into satin the manufacturer goes forward at all hours the action events of our childhood and youth are now matters of calmest observation they lie like fair pictures in the air not so with our recent actions with the business which we now have at hand on this we are quite unable to speculate our affections are yet circulate through it we no more feel or know it than we feel the feet or the hand or the brain of our body the new deed is yet a part of life remains for a time immersed in our unconscious life in some contemplative hour it detaches itself from the life like a ripe fruit to become a thought of the mind instantly it is raised transfigured the corruptible has put on incorruption henceforth it is an object of beauty however base its origin and neighborhood observe too the impossibility of antedating this act in its grub state it cannot fly it cannot shine it is a dull grub but suddenly without observation the self-same thing unfurls beautiful wings and is an angel of wisdom so there is no fact no event in our private history which shall not sooner or later lose its adhesive inert form and astonish us by soaring from our body into the empyrean cradle and infancy school and playground the fear of boys and dogs and furals the love of little maids and berries and many another fact that once filled the whole sky are gone already friend and relative profession and party town and country and nation and world must also soar and sing of course he who has put forth his total strength in fit action has the richest return of wisdom i will not shut myself out of this globe of action and transplant an oak into a flower pot there to hunger and pine nor trust the revenue of some single faculty and exhaust one vein of thought much like the savoyards who getting their livelihood by carving shepherds shepherdesses and smoking dutchmen for all europe went out one day to the mountain to find stock and discovered that they had willed up the last of their pine trees authors we have in numbers who have written out their vein and who moved by commendable prudence sail for greece or palestine follow the trapper into the prairie or ramble around algiers to replenish their merchantable stock if it were only for a vocabulary the scholar would be covetous of action life is our dictionary years are well spent in country labors in town in the insight into trades and manufactures in frank intercourse with many men and women 
in science, in art, to the one end of mastering and all their facts of language by which to illustrate and body our perceptions. I learn immediately from any speaker how much he has already lived, through the poverty or the splendor of his speech. Life lies behind us as the quarry from whence we get tiles and copestones for the masonry of today. This is the way to learn grammar. Colleges and books only copy the language with the field and the workyard made. But the final value of action, like that of books, and better than books, is that it is a resource. The great principle of undulation in nature, that shows itself in the inspiring and expiring of the breath, in desire and satiety, in the ebb and flow of the sea, in day and night, in heat and cold, and as yet more deeply ingrained in every atom and every fluid, is known to us under the name of polarity. These fits of easy transmission and reflection, as Newton called them, are the laws of nature because they are the laws of the spirit. The mind now thinks, now acts, and each fact reproduces the other. When the artist has exhausted his materials, when his fancy no longer paints, when thoughts are no longer apprehended, and books are a weariness, he has always the resource to live. Character is higher than intellect. Thinking is the function, life the functionary. The stream retreats to its source. A great soul will be strong to live, as well as strong to think. Does he lack organ or medium to impart his truths? He can still fall back on this elemental force of living them. This is a total act. Thinking is a partial act. Let the grandeur of justice shine on his affairs. Let the beauty of affection cheer his lowly roof. Those far from fame, who dwell and act with him, will feel the force of his constitution in the doings and passages of the days better than it can be measured by any public or designed display. Time shall teach him that the scholar loses no hour which the man lives. Herein he unfolds the sacred germ of his instinct, screened from influence. What is lost in seemliness is gained in strength. Not out of those on whom systems of education have exhausted their culture come the helpful giant, to destroy the old to build the new, but out of the unhandled savage nature, out of the terrible druids and berserkers, come at last Alfred and Shakespeare. I hear, therefore, with joy, whatever is beginning to be said of the dignity and necessity of labor to every citizen. There is virtue yet in the hoe and the spade, for learned as well as for unlearned hands. Labor is everywhere welcome, always we are invited to work. Only by this limitation observe, that a man shall not for the sake of wider activity sacrifice any opinion at the popular judgment and modes of action. I have now spoken of the education of the scholar by nature, by books, and by action. It remains to say somewhat of his duties. They are such as become man-thinking. They may all be comprised in self-trust. The office of the scholar is to cheer, to raise, and to guide men by showing them facts amidst appearances. He plies the slow, unhonored, and unpaid task of observation. Flamsteed and Herschel, in their glazed observatories, may catalog the stars with the praise of all men, yet the results, being splendid and useful, honor is sure. But he, in his private observatory, cataloging obscure nebulous stars of the human mind, which as yet no man has thought of as such, watching days and months, sometimes for a few facts, correcting still his old records, must relinquish display and immediate fame. In the long period of his preparation, he must betray often an ignorance and shiftlessness in popular arts, incurring the disdain of the able who shoulder him aside. Long he must stammer in his speech, often for gold living for the dead. Worse yet, he must accept, how often, poverty and solitude. For the ease and pleasure of treading the old road, accepting the fashions and education, the religion of society, to make the cross of making his own, and, of course, the self-accusation, the faint heart, the frequent uncertainty and loss of time, which are the nettles and tangling vines in the way of the self-relying and self-directed, and the state of virtual hostility in which he seems to stand to society, and especially to educate his society. For all this loss and scorn, what offset? He has defined consolation and exercise in the highest function of human nature. He is one who raises himself from private considerations and breathes and lives on public and illustrious thoughts. He is the world's eye. He is the world's heart. He is to resist the vulgar prosperity that retrogrades even to barbarism by preserving and communicating heroic sentiments, noble biographies, melodious verse, and the conclusions of history. Whatsoever oracles the human heart in all emergencies and all solemn hours has uttered as its commentary on the world of actions, these he shall receive and impart. And whatever new verdict reason from her inviolable seat pronounces on the passing men and events of today, this he shall hear and promulgate. These being his functions, it becomes him to feel all confidence in himself, and defer never to the popular cry. He and he only knows the world. The world of any moment is the merest appearance. 
Some great decorum, some fetish of a government, some ephemeral trade, or war, or man, is cried up by half mankind, and cried down by their half, as if all depended on this particular up and down. The odds are that the whole question is not worth the poorest thought which the scholar has lost in listening to the controversy. Let him not quit his belief that a pop-gun is a pop-gun, though the ancient honorable of the earth affirm it to be the crack of doom. In silence, in steadiness, in severe abstraction, let him hold by himself. Add observation to observation, patient of neglect, patient of reproach, and bide his own time, happy enough, if he can satisfy himself alone, that this day he has seen something truly. Success treads on every right step, for the instinct is sure that prompts him to tell his brother what he thinks. He then learns that going down into the secrets of his own mind, he has descended into the secrets of all minds. He learns that he who has mastered any law in his private thoughts is master to that extent of all men whose language he speaks and of all whose language his own can be translated. The poet, in utter solitude, remembering his spontaneous thoughts and recording them, is found to have recorded that which men in crowded cities find true for them also. The orator distrusts at first the fitness of his frank confessions, his want of knowledge of the persons he addresses, until he finds that he is the complement of his hearers, that they drink his words because he fulfills for them their own nature. The deeper he dives in his privatest, secretest presentiment, to his wonder he finds, this is the most acceptable, most public, and universally true. The people delight in it. The better part of every man feels, this is my music, this is myself. In self-trust, all the virtues are comprehended. Free should the scholar be, free and brave, free even to the definition of freedom, without any hindrance that does not arise out of his own constitution. Brave, for fear is a thing which a scholar by his very function puts behind him. Fear always springs from ignorance. It is a shame to find if his tranquillity amidst dangerous times arises from the presumption that, like children and women, his is a protected class, or if he seek a temporary peace by the diversion of his thoughts from politics or vexed questions, hiding his head like an ostrich in the flowering bushes, peeping into microscopes, or turning rhymes as a boy whistles to keep up his courage. So is the danger a dangerous still, so is the fear worse. Manlike, let him turn and face it. Let him look into its eye, and search its nature, inspect its origin, see the whelping of this lion, which lies no great way back. He will then find in himself a perfect comprehension of its nature and extent. He will have made his hands meet on the other side, and can henceforth defy it, and pass on superior. The world is his, who can see through its pretension. What deafness, what stone-blown custom, what overgrown air you behold, is there only by sufferance, by your sufferance? See it to be a lie, and you have already dealt it its mortal blow. Yes, we are the cowed, we are the trustless. It is a mischievous notion that we are come late into nature, that the world was finished a long time ago. As the world was plastic and fluid in the hands of God, so it is ever to so much of his attributes as we bring to it. To ignorance and sin it is flint. They adapt themselves to it as they may. But in proportion as a man has anything in him divine, the firmament flows before him and takes his signet in form. Not he is great who can alter matter, but he who can alter my state of mind. They are the kings of the world, who give the color of their present thought to all nature and all art, and persuade men by the cheerful serenity of their carrying the matter that this thing which they do is the apple which the ages have desired to pluck, now at last ripe, and inviting nation to the harvest. The great man makes the great thing. Wherever MacDonald sits, there is the head of the table. Linnaeus makes botany the most alluring of studies, and it wins it from the farmer and the herb woman. Davy chemistry, and Cuvier fossils. The day is always his, who works on it with serenity and great aims. The unstable estimates of men crowd to him whose mind is filled with the truth, as a heaped wave of the Atlantic follows the moon. For this self-trust, the reason is deeper than can be fathomed, darker than can be lightened. I might not carry with me the feeling of my audience in stating my own belief, but I have already shown the ground of my hope in averting it to the doctrine that man is one. I believe man has been wronged. He has wronged himself. He has almost lost the light that can lead him back to his prerogatives. Men are become of no account. Men in history, men in the world of today are bugs, are spawn, and are called the mass, the herd. In a century, in a millennium, one or two men, that is to say, one or two approximations to the right state of every man. All the rest behold in the hero of the poet their own green and crude being ripened. Yes, and our consent to be less, so that may attain to its full nature. What a testimony, full of grandeur, full of pity, is borne to the demands of his nature, by the poor clansman, the poor partisan, who rejoices in the glory of his chief. 
the poor and low find some amends to their immense moral capacity for their acquiescence in a political and social inferiority they are content to be brushed like flies from the path of the great person so that justice shall be done by him to that common nature which it is the dearest desire of all to see enlarged and glorified they ascend themselves in the great man's light and feel it to be their own element they cast the dignity of man from their downtrodden selves upon the shoulders of a hero, and will perish to add one drop of blood to make that great heart beat, those giant sinews combat and conquer. He lives for us, and we live in him. Men such as they are very naturally seek money or power, and power because it is good as money, the spoil so called of office. And why not? For they desire to be the highest, and this, in their sleepwalking, they dream is highest. Wake them, and they shall quit the false good, and leap to the true, and leave governments to clerks and desks. This revolution is to be wrought by the gradual domestication of the idea of culture. The main enterprise of the world for splendor, for extent, is the upbuilding of a man. Here are the materials strewn along the ground. The private life of one man shall be a more illustrious monarchy, more formidable to its enemy, more sweet and serene in its influence to its friend, than any kingdom in history. For a man rightly viewed comprehendeth the particular natures of all men. Each philosopher, each bard, each actor has only done for me, as by a delegate, or well, one day I can do for myself. The books which once we valued more than the apple of the eye we have quite exhausted. What is that but saying that we have come up with the point of view which the universal mind took through the eyes of one scribe? We have been that man, and have passed on. First one, then another, we drain all cisterns and waxing greater by all these supplies, we crave a better and more abundant food. The man has never lived that can feed us ever. The human mind cannot be enshrined in a person who shall set a barrier on any one side to his unbounded, unboundable empire. It is one central fire which, flaming out of the lips of Etna, lightens the capes of Sicily, and now out the throats of Vesuvius illuminates the towers and vineyards of Naples. It is one light which beams out of a thousand stars. It is one soul which animates all men. But I have dealt perhaps tediously upon this abstraction of the scholar. I ought not to delay any longer to add what I have to say, of nearer reference to the time and to this country. Historically, there is thought to be a difference in the ideas which predominate over successive epochs, and there are data for marking the genius of the classic, the romantic, and now the reflective or philosophic age. With the views I have intimated of the oneness or the identity of the mind through all individuals, I do not yet dwell on these differences. In fact, I believe each individual passes through all three. The boy is a Greek, the youth romantic, the adult reflective. I deny it not, however, that a revolution in the leading idea may be distinctly enough traced. Our age is bewildered as the age of introversion. Must that needs be evil? We, it seems, are critical. We are embarrassed with second thoughts. We cannot enjoy anything for hankering to know whereof the pleasure consists. We are lined with eyes. We see with our feet. The time is infected with hamlets and happiness, sicklied over with the pale cast of thought. Is it so bad, then? Sight is the last thing to be pitied. Would we be blind? Do we fear lest we should outsee nature and God and drink truth dry? I look upon the discontent of the literary class as a mere announcement of the fact that they find themselves not in the state of mind of their fathers and regret the coming state as untried, as a boy dreads the water before he has learned that he can swim. If there is any period one should desire to be born in, is it not the age of revolution, when the old and new stand side by side and admit of being compared, when the energies of all men are searched by fear and by hope, when the historic glories of the old can be compensated by the rich possibilities of the new era? This time, like all times, is a very good one, if we but know what to do with it. I read with joy some of the auspicious signs of the coming days as the glimmer already through poetry and art, through philosophy and science, through church and state. One of these signs is the fact that the same movement which affected the elevation of what was called the lowest class in the state assumed in literature a very marked and as benign an aspect. Instead of the sublime and the beautiful, the near, the low, the common was explored and poeticized. That which has been negligently trodden underfoot by those who are harnessing and provisioning themselves for long journeys into far countries is suddenly found to be richer than all foreign parts. The literature of the poor, the feelings of the child, the philosophy of the street, the meaning of the house life are the topics of the same. It is a great stride. It is a sign, is it not, of new vigor when the extremities are made active, when currents of warm life run into the hands and the feet. I ask not for the great, the remote, the romantic. What is doing in Italy or Arabia? What is Greek art, provincial minstrelsy? 
I embrace the common. I explore and sit at the feet of the familiar, the low. Give me insight into today, and you may have the antique and future worlds. What would we really know the meaning of? The meal in the firkin, the milk in the pan, the ballad in the street, the news of the boat, the glance of the eye, the form and the gait of the body. Show me the ultimate reasons for these matters. Show me the sublime presence of the highest spiritual cause lurking, as always it does, in these suburbs and extremities of nature. Let me see every trifle bristling with polarity that ranges it instantly on an eternal law. And the shop, the plough, and the ledger refer to the light cause by which light undulates and poets sing, and the world lies no longer a dull miscellany and lumber room, but has form and order. There is no trifle, there is no puzzle, but one design unites and animates the farthest pinnacle in the lowest trench. This idea has inspired the genius of Goldsmith, Burns, Coper, and in a newer time of Goethe, Wordsworth, and Carlyle. This idea they have differently followed and with various success. In contrast with their writings, the style of Pope, of Johnson, of Gibbon, look cold and pedantic. This writing is blood-warm. Man is surprised to find that things near are not less beautiful and wondrous than things remote. The near explains the far. The drop is a small ocean. A man is related to all nature. This perception of the worth of the vulgar is fruitful in discoveries. Goethe, in this very thing, the most modern of the moderns, has shown us, as none ever did, the genius of the ancients. There is one man of genius who has done much for this philosophy of life, whose literary value has never yet been rightly estimated. I mean Emanuel Swedenborg. The most imaginative of men, yet writing with the precision of a mathematician, he endeavors to engraft a pure philosophical ethics on the popular Christianity of his time. Such an attempt, of course, must have difficulty, which no genius could surmount, but he saw and showed the connection between nature and the affections of the soul. He pierced the emblematic or spiritual character of the visible, audible, tangible world. Especially did his shade-loving muse hover and interpret the lower parts of nature. He showed the mysterious bond that allies moral evil to the foul material forms, and has given in epical parables a theory of insanity, of beasts, of unclean and fearful things. Another sign of the times, also marked by an analogous political movement, is the new importance given to the single person. Everything that tends to insulate the individual, to surround him with barriers of natural respect, so that each man shall feel the world is his, the man shall treat with man as a sovereign state with a sovereign state, tends to true union as well as greatness. I learned, said the melancholy Pastelosi, that no man in God's wide earth is either willing or able to help any other man. Help must come from the bosom alone. The scholar is that man who must take up into himself all the ability of the time, all the contributions of the past, all the hopes of the future. He must be a university of knowledges. If there be one lesson more than another which shall pierce his ear, it is, The world is nothing, the man is all. In yourself is the law of all nature, and you know not yet how a globule of sap ascends. In yourself slumbers the whole of reason. It is for you to know all, it is for you to dare all. Mr. President and gentlemen, this confidence in the unsearched might of man belongs, by all motives, by all prophecy, by all preparation, to the American scholar. We have listened too long to the courtly muses of Europe. The spirit of the American freeman is already suspected to be timid, imitative, tame. Public and private avarice make the air we breathe thick and fat. The scholar is decent, indolent, complacent. See already the tragic consequence. The mind of this country, taught to aim at low objects, eats upon itself. There is no work for any but the decorous and the complacent. Young men of the fairest promise, who begin life upon our shores, inflated by the mountain winds, shined upon by the stars of God, find the earth below not in unison with these, but are hindered from action by the disgust which the principles on which business is managed inspire, and turn drudges or die of disgust, some of them suicides. What is the remedy? They do not yet see, and thousands of young men as hopeful now crowding to the barriers of the career do not yet see, that if the single man plant himself indomitably on his instincts, and there abide, the huge world will come round to him. Patience, patience. With the shades of all the good and great for company, and for solace the perspective of your own infinite life, and for work the study of the communication of principles, and making those instincts prevalent, the conversion of the world. Is it not a cheap disgrace in the world not to be a unit, not to be reckoned one character, not to yield that peculiar fruit which each man was created to bear, but to be reckoned in the gross, in the hundred, or the thousand, of the party, the section to which we belong, and our opinion predicted geographically as the north or the south? Not so, brothers and friends. Please God, ours shall not be so. 
We will walk on our own feet. We will work with our own hands. We will speak our own minds. The study of letters shall be no longer a name for pity, for doubt, and for sensual indulgence. The dread of man and love of man shall be a wall of defense and a wreath of joy around all. A nation of men will for the first time exist, because each believes himself inspired by the divine soul, which also inspires all men. End of The American Scholar Recording by Daniel Christopher June You may visit my website at perfectidius.com That's perfect, I-D-I-U-S dot com An Address by Benjamin Franklin to the Continental Congress June 2, 1787 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by A Founder's Keeper, The Progressing America Project. Benjamin Franklin to the Continental Congress. Sir, it is with reluctance that I rise to express a disapprobation of any one article of the plan for which we are so much obliged to the honorable gentleman who laid it before us. From its first reading I have borne a good will to it, and in general wished it success. In this particular of salaries to the executive branch, I happen to differ and as my opinion may appear new and chimerical, it is only from a persuasion that it is right, and from a sense of duty, that I hazard it. The committee will judge of my reasons when they have heard them, and their judgment may possibly change mine. I think I see inconveniences in the appointment of salaries, I see none in refusing them, but, on the contrary, great advantages. Sir, there are two passions which have a powerful influence on the affairs of men. These are ambition and avarice, the love of power, and the love of money. Separately, each of these has great force in prompting men to action but when united in view of the same object, they have in many minds the most violent effects. Place before the eyes of such men a post of honor, that shall be at the same time a place of profit, and they will move heaven and earth to obtain it. The vast number of such places it is that renders the British government so tempestuous. The struggles for them are the true sources of all those factions which are perpetually dividing the nation, distracting its councils, hurrying sometimes into fruitless and mischievous wars, and often compelling a submission to dishonorable terms of peace. And of what kind are the men that will strive for this profitable preeminence, through all the bustle of cabal, the heat of contention, the infinite mutual abuse of parties, tearing to pieces the best of characters? It will not be the wise and moderate, the lovers of peace and good order, the men fittest for the trust. It will be the bold and the violent, the men of strong passions and indefatigable activity in their selfish pursuits. These will thrust themselves into your government, and be your rulers. And these, too, will be mistaken in the expected happiness of their situation, for their vanquished competitors, of the same spirit, and from the same motives, will perpetually be endeavoring to distress their administration, thwart their measures, and render them odious to the people. Besides these evils, sir, though we may set out in the beginning with moderate salaries, we shall find that such will not be of long continuance. Reasons will never be wanting for proposed augmentations, and there will always be a party for giving more to the rulers, 
that the rulers may be able in return to give more to them. Hence, as all history informs us, there has been in every state and kingdom a constant kind of warfare between the governing and governed, the one striving to obtain more for its support, and the other to pay less. And this has alone occasioned great convulsions, actual civil wars, ending either in dethroning of the princes or enslaving of the people. Generally, indeed, the ruling power carries its point, the revenue of princes constantly increasing, and we see that they are never satisfied, but always in want of more. The more the people are discontented with the oppression of taxes, the greater need the prince has of money to distribute among his partisans, and pay the troops that are to suppress all resistance, and enable him to plunder at pleasure. There is scarce a king in a hundred, who would not, if he could, follow the example of Pharaoh. Get first all the people's money, then all their lands, and then make them and their children servants forever. It will be said that we don't propose to establish kings. I know it, but there is a natural inclination in mankind to kingly government. It sometimes relieves them from aristocratic domination. They had rather have one tyrant than five hundred. It gives more of the appearance of equality among citizens, and that they like. I am apprehensive, therefore, perhaps too apprehensive, that the government of these states may in future times end in a monarchy. But this catastrophe I think may be long delayed, if in our proposed system we do not sow the seeds of contention, faction, and tumult, by making our posts of honor places of profit. If we do, I fear that, though we do employ at first a number, and not a single person, the number will in time be set aside, it will only nourish the fetus of a king, as the honorable gentleman from Virginia very aptly expressed it, and a king will the sooner be set over us. It may be imagined by some that this is a utopian idea, and that we can never find men to serve us in this executive department without paying them well for their services. I conceive this to be a mistake. Some existing facts present themselves to me, which incline me to a contrary opinion. The high sheriff of a county, in England, is an honorable office, but it is not a profitable one. It is rather expensive, and therefore not sought for, but yet it is executed, and well executed, and usually by some of the principal gentlemen of the county. In France, the office of councillor, or member of their judiciary parliament, is more honorable. It is therefore purchased at a high price. There are, indeed, fees on the law proceedings, which are divided among them, but these fees do not amount to more than three per cent on the sum paid for the place. Therefore, as legal interest is there at five per cent, they in fact pay two per cent for being allowed to do the judiciary business of the nation, which is, at the same time, entirely exempt from the burden of paying them any salaries for their services. I do not, however, mean to recommend this as an eligible mode for our judiciary department. I only bring the instance to show that the pleasure of doing good and serving their country, 
and the respect such conduct entitles them to, are sufficient motives with some minds to give up a great portion of their time to the public, without the mean inducement of pecuniary satisfaction. Another instance is that of a respectable society who have made the experiment and practiced it with success more than one hundred years. I mean the Quakers. It is an established rule with them that they are not to go to law, but in their controversies they must apply to their monthly, quarterly, and yearly meetings. Committees of these sit with patience to hear the parties, and spend much time in composing their differences. In doing this, they are supported by a sense of duty, and the respect paid to usefulness. It is honorable to be so employed, but it is never made profitable by salaries, fees, or perquisites. And, indeed, in all cases of public service, the less the profit, the greater the honor. To bring the matter nearer home, have we not seen the greatest and most important of our offices, that of general of our armies, executed for eight years together, without the smallest salary, by a patriot whom I will not now offend by any other praise, and this through fatigues and distresses, in common with the other brave men, his military friends and companions, and the constant anxieties peculiar to his station? And shall we doubt finding three or four men, in all the United States, with public spirit enough to bear sitting in peaceful council for perhaps an equal term, merely to preside over our civil concerns, and see that our laws are duly executed? Sir, I have a better opinion of our country. I think we shall never be without a sufficient number of wise and good men to undertake and execute well and faithfully the office in question. Sir, the saving of the salaries that may at first be proposed is not an object with me. The subsequent mischiefs of proposing them are what I apprehend, and therefore it is that I move the amendment. If it is not seconded or accepted, I must be contented with the satisfaction of having delivered my opinion frankly and done my duty. End of Benjamin Franklin to the Continental Congress Letter to Mrs. Bixby by Abraham Lincoln This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Executive Mansion, Washington, November 21st, 1864. Mrs. Bixby, Boston, Massachusetts. Dear Madam, I have been shown in the files of the War Department a statement of the Adjutant General of Massachusetts that you are the mother of five sons who have died gloriously on the field of battle. I feel how weak and fruitless must be any words of mine which should attempt to beguile you from the grief of a loss so overwhelming. But I cannot refrain from tendering to you the consolation that may be found in the thanks of the Republic they died to save. I pray that our Heavenly Father may assuage the anguish of your bereavement and leave you only the cherished memory of the loved and lost, and the solemn pride that must be yours to have laid so costly a sacrifice upon the altar of freedom. Yours very sincerely and respectfully, A. Lincoln. End of letter to Mrs. Bixby.
Excerpts Concerning Costermongers from London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Religion of Costermongers An intelligent and trustworthy man, until very recently actively engaged in costermongering, computed that not three in one hundred costermongers had ever been in the interior of a church, or any place of worship, or knew what was meant by Christianity. The same person gave me the following account, which was confirmed by others. The costers have no religion at all, and very little notion, or none at all, of what religion or a future state is. Of all things they hate tracts. They hate them because the people leaving them never give them anything, and as they can't read the tract, not one in forty, they're vexed to be bothered with it. And really, what is the use of giving people reading before you've told them to read? Now, they respect the city missionaries because they read to them, and the costers will listen to reading when they don't understand it, and because they visit the sick, and sometimes give oranges and such like to them and the children. I've known a city missionary buy a shilling's worth of oranges of a coster and give them away to the sick and the children, most of them belonging to the costermongers, down the court, and that made him respected there. I think the city missionaries have done good, but I'm satisfied that if the costers had to profess themselves as some religion tomorrow, they would all become Roman Catholics, every one of them. This is the reason. London costers live very often in the same courts and streets as the poor Irish, and if the Irish are sick, be sure there comes to them the priest, the sisters of charity, they are good women, and some other ladies. Many a man that's not a Catholic has rotted and died without any good person near him. Why, I lived a good while in Lambeth, and there wasn't one coster in one hundred, I'm satisfied, knew so much as the rector's name, though Mr. Dalton's a very good man. But the reason I was telling you of, sir, is that the costers reckon that religion's the best that gives the most in charity, and they think the Catholics do this. I'm not a Catholic myself, but I believe every word of the Bible, and have the greater belief that it's the word of God because it teaches democracy. The Irish in the courts get sadly chaffed by the others about their priests, but they'll die for the priest. Religion is a regular puzzle to the costers. They see people coming out of church and chapel, and as they're mostly well-dressed, and there's very few of their own sort among the churchgoers, the costers somehow mix up being religious with being respectable, and so they have a queer sort of feeling about it. It's a mystery to them. It's shocking when you come to think of it. They'll listen to any preacher that goes among them, and then a few will say, I've heard it often, a bloody fool, why don't he let people go to hell their own way? There's another thing that makes the costers think so well of the Catholics. If a Catholic coster, there's only very few of them, is cracked up, penniless, he's often started again, and the others have a notion that it's through some chapel fund. I don't know whether it is so or not, but I know the cracked up men are started again, if they're Catholics. It's still the stranger that the regular costermongers, who are nearly all Londoners, should have such respect for the Roman Catholics, when they have such a hatred of the Irish, whom they look upon as intruders and underminers. If a missionary came among us with plenty of money, said another costermonger, he might make us all Christians, or Turks, or anything he liked. Neither the Latter-day Saints, nor any similar sect, have made converts among the costermongers. Of the uneducated state of costermongers. I have stated elsewhere that only about one in ten of the regular costermongers is able to read. The want of education among both men and women is deplorable, and I tested it in several instances. The following statement, however, from one of the body, is no more to be taken as representing the ignorance of the class generally than are the clear and discriminating accounts I received from intelligent costermongers to be taken as representing the intelligence of the body. The man with whom I conversed, and from whom I received the following statement, seemed about thirty. He was certainly not ill-looking, but with a heavy cast of countenance, his light blue eyes having little expression. His statements, or opinions, I need hardly explain, were given both spontaneously in the course of conversation and in answer to my questions. I give them almost verbatim, omitting oaths and slang. "'Well, times is bad, sir,' he said. "'But it's a deadish time. I don't do so well at present times as in middleish times, I think. When I served the Prince of Naples not far from here—I presume that he alluded to the Prince of Capua—I did better, and times was better. That was five years ago, but I can't say to a year or two. He was a good customer, and was very fond of peaches. I used to sell them to him at twelve shillings the plasket when they was new. The plasket held a dozen, and cost me six shillings at Covent Garden. More sometimes, but I didn't charge him more when they did. His footman was a black man, and an ignorant man quite, 
and his housekeeper was an English woman. He was the Prince of Naples, was my customer, but I don't know what he was like, for I never saw him. I've heard that he was the brother of the King of Naples. I can't say where Naples is, but if you was to ask at Euston Square, they'll tell you the fare there and the time to go it in. It may be in France for anything I know, may Naples, or in Ireland. Why don't you ask at the square? I went to Croydon once by rail, and slept all the way without stirring, and so you may to Naples for anything I know. I never heard of the Pope being a neighbour of the King of Naples. Do you mean living next door to him? But I don't know nothing of the King of Naples, only the Prince. I don't know what the Pope is. Is he any trade? It's nothing to me when he's no customer of mine. I have nothing to say about nobody that ain't no customers. My crabs is caught in the sea, in course. I gets them at Billingsgate. I never saw the sea, but it's salt water, I know. I can't say whereabouts it lays. I believe it's in the hands of the Billingsgate salesman. All of it? I've heard of shipwrecks at sea caused by drowning, in course. I never heard that the Prince of Naples was ever at sea. I like to talk about him. He was such a customer when he lived near here. Here he repeated his account of the supply of peaches to His Royal Highness. I never was in France, no, sir, never. I don't know the way. Do you think I could do better there? I never was in the Republic there. What's it like? Bonaparte? Oh, yes, I've heard of him. He was at Waterloo. I didn't know he'd been alive now and in France, as you ask me about him. I don't think you're liking, sir. Did I hear of the French taking possession of Naples and Bonaparte making his brother-in-law king? Well, I didn't, but it may be true, because I served the Prince of Naples what was the brother of the king. I never heard whether the prince was the king's older brother or his younger. I wish he may turn out his older, if there's property coming to him, as the oldest has the first turn, at least so I've heard, first come first served. I've worked the streets and the courts at all times. I've worked them by moonlight, but you couldn't see the moonlight where it was busy. I can't say how far the moon's off us. It's nothing to me, but I've seen it a good bit higher than St Paul's. I don't know nothing about the sun. Why do you ask? It must be nearer than the moon, for it's warmer. And if they're both fire, that shows it. It's like the taproom grate and that bit of a gaslight, to compare the two is. What was St. Paul's that the moon was above? A church, sir, so I've heard. I never was in a church. Oh, yes, I've heard of God. He made heaven and earth. I never heard of his making the sea. That's another thing. And you can best learn about that at Billingsgate. He seemed to think that the sea was an appurtenance of Billingsgate. Jesus Christ? Yes. I've heard of him. Our Redeemer? Well, I only wish I could redeem my Sunday togs from my uncle's. Another costermonger, in answer to inquiries, said, I suppose you think us original coves that you ask. We're not like Methuselah or some such swell's name. I presume that Malthus was meant, as wanted to murder children afore they was born, as I once heard lectured about. We're nothing like that. Another, on being questioned, and on being told that the information was wanted for the press, replied, The press? I'll have nothing to say to it. We are oppressed enough already. That a class numbering 30,000 should be permitted to remain in a state of almost brutish ignorance is a national disgrace. If the London costers belong especially to the dangerous classes, the danger of such a body is assuredly an evil of our own creation. For the gratitude of the poor creatures to any one who seeks to give them the least knowledge is almost pathetic. Of the dress of the costermongers. From the homes of the costermongers we pass to a consideration of their dress. The costermongers' ordinary costume partakes of the durability of the warehouseman's, with the quaintness of that of the stable boy. A well to do coster, when dressed for the day's work, usually wears a small cloth cap, a little on one side. A close fitting worsted tie up skull cap is very fashionable just now among the class and ringlets at the temples are looked up to as the height of elegance. Hats they never wear, excepting on Sunday, on account of their baskets being frequently carried on their heads. Coats are seldom indulged in. Their waistcoats, which are of a broad-ribbed corduroy, with fustian back and sleeves, being made as long as a groom's, and buttoned up nearly to the throat. If the corduroy be of a light sandy colour, then plain brass or sporting buttons, with raised foxes or stags' heads upon them, or else black bone buttons with a flower pattern ornament the front. But if the cord be of a dark ratskin hue, then mother-of-pearl buttons are preferred. Two large pockets, sometimes four, with huge flaps or lapels like those in a shooting coat, are commonly worn. 
If the costermonger be driving a good trade, and have his set of regular customers, he will sport a blue cloth jacket, similar in cut to the cord ones above described. But this is looked upon as an extravagance of the highest order, for the slime and scales of the fish stick to the sleeves and shoulder of the garment, so as to spoil the appearance of it in a short time. The fashionable stuff for trousers, at the present, is a dark-coloured cable cord, and they are made to fit tightly at the knee, and swell gradually until they reach the boot, which they nearly cover. Velveteen is now seldom worn, and knee-breeches are quite out of date. Those who deal wholly in fish wear a blue serge apron, either hanging down or tucked up round their waist. The costermonger, however, prides himself most of all upon his neckerchief and boots. Men, women, boys and girls all have a passion for these articles. The man who does not wear his silk neckerchief, his kingsman as it is called, is known to be in desperate circumstances, the inference being that it has gone to supply the morning stock money. A yellow flower on a green ground, or a red and blue pattern, is at present greatly in vogue. The women wear their kerchiefs tucked in under their gowns, and the men have theirs wrapped loosely round the neck, with the ends hanging over their waistcoats. Even if a costermonger has two or three silk handkerchiefs by him already, he seldom hesitates to buy another, when tempted with a bright, showy pattern hanging from a field-lane doorpost. The costermonger's love of a good, strong boot is a singular prejudice that runs throughout the whole class. From the father to the youngest child, all will be found well shod. So strong is their predilection in this respect, that a costermonger may be immediately known by a glance at his feet. He will part with everything rather than his boots, and to wear a pair of second-hand ones, or translators as they are called, is felt as a bitter degradation by them all. Among the men this pride has risen to such a pitch that many will have their upper leathers tastily ornamented, and it is not uncommon to see the younger men of this class with a heart or a thistle surrounded by a wreath of roses worked below the instep on their boots. The general costume of the women, or girls, is a black velveteen or straw bonnet, with a few ribbons or flowers, and almost always a net cap fitting closely to the cheek. The silk kingsman covering their shoulders is sometimes tucked into the neck of the printed cotton gown, and sometimes the ends are brought down outside to the apron strings. Silk dresses are never worn by them. They rather despise such articles. The petticoats are worn short, ending at the ankles, just high enough to show the whole of the much-admired boots. Coloured, or illustrated shirts, as they are called, are especially objected to by the men. On the Sunday, no costermonger will, if he can possibly avoid it, wheel a barrow. If a shilling be an especial object to him, he may, perhaps, take his shallow and head-basket as far as Chalk Farm, or some neighbouring resort, but even then he objects strongly to the Sunday trading. They leave this to the Jews and Irish, who are always willing to earn a penny, as they say. The prosperous coster will have his holiday on the Sunday, and if possible his Sunday suit as well, which usually consists of a rough beaver hat, brown petersum, with velvet facings of the same colour, and cloth trousers with stripes down the side. The women, generally, manage to keep by them a cotton gown of a bright showy pattern, and a new shawl. As one of the craft said to me, Costas likes to see their gals and wives look ladylike when they takes them out. Such of the costas as are not in a flourishing way of business, seldom make any alteration in their dress on the Sunday. There are but five tailors in London who make the garb proper to costermongers. One of these is considered somewhat slop, or, as a coster called him, a springer up. This springer up is blamed by some of the costermongers, who condemn him for employing women at reduced wages. A whole court of costermongers, I was assured, would withdraw their custom from a tradesman if one of their body, who had influence among them, showed that the tradesman was unjust to his workpeople. The tailor in question issues bills after the following fashion. I give one verbatim, merely withholding the address for obvious reasons. Once try, you'll come again. Slap up Tog and out and out kisks his builder. Mr. Blank nabs the chance of putting his customers awake that he has just made his escape from Russia, not forgetting to clap his maulers upon some of the right sort of ducks to make single and double-backed slops for gentlemen in black, when on his return home he was stunned to find one of the top manufacturers of Manchester had cut his lucky and stepped off to the Swan Stream, leaving behind him a valuable stock of moleskins, cords, velveteens, plushes, swan downs, etc., and I, having some ready in my kick, grabbed the chance and stepped home with my swag, and am now safe landed at my crib. I can turn out toggery of every description, very slap up, at the following low prices for ready gilt. Tick being no go. Upper Benjamin's built on a downy plan, a monarch to half a finnuff. 
slap up velveteen togs, lined with the same, one pound one quarter and a peg. Moleskin ditto, any colour, lined with the same, one cooter. A pair of Kersimir's kickses, any colour, built very slap up with the artful dodge, a canary. Pair of stout cord ditto, built in the Melton Mowbray style, half a sov. Pair of very good broad cord ditto, made very saucy, nine bob and a kick. Pair of long sleeve moleskin, all colours, built hanky spanky, with a double fakement down the side and artful buttons at the bottom, half a monarch. Pair of stout ditto, built very serious, nine times. Pair of out and out fancy sleeve kickses, cut to drop down on the trotters, two bulls. Waist togs, cut long with moleskin back and sleeves, ten peg. Blue cloth ditto, cut slap with pearl buttons, fourteen peg. Mud pipes, knee caps, and trotter cases, built very low. A decent allowance made to seedy swells, tea kettle purgers, head robbers, and flunkies out of collar. NB. Gentlemen finding their own brody can be accommodated. End of Excerpts Concerning Costermongers from London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew. Read by Jason Mills. The Funeral of Pool from the New York Daily Times, March 12, 1855. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. We have seen a great many very large popular demonstrations in this city at the funerals of great and distinguished men, but we remember none that exceeded in numbers that of William Poole, who was buried yesterday. The streets in the vicinity of his residence in Christopher Street, the large open space directly in front of his house, the windows, piazzas, and roofs of the adjacent buildings were crowded to suffocation, while Bleecker Street, Broadway, and all the streets in this city and Brooklyn through which the procession passed, were lined by an immense multitude of spectators, whose appearance and demeanor were in the highest degree respectable and decorous. A stranger, knowing nothing of the circumstances of the case, would deem it strange that the death of a man celebrated for nothing but his propensities and faculties for fighting should call out a popular demonstration at least equal to that witnessed at the obsequies of Jackson, Clay, or Webster. Persons familiar with this city and the peculiar features of this case, however, will have no difficulty in finding an explanation less discreditable to our people than the naked facts would imply. Poole had a great many friends among the class to which he belonged, comprising not only the fighting men and rowdies of the city, but the butchers, mechanics, and working men at large. He had many good qualities, was bold and fearless in defense of his friends, lavish with money which he never lacked, and was so generally known to the great mass of the people that his death under any circumstances would have attracted attention and commanded sympathy. But the tragedy which ended his life was one of the most brutal and fearful ever known in our city. It startled the public mind more than any similar event that has occurred for years. A gang of ruffians had laid a distinct and premeditated plot to murder him. Half a dozen of them, armed with revolvers, assailed him when almost alone and wholly unarmed, and failing to provoke him by the utmost insolence they could use towards him, shot him in cold blood. His own behavior under the attack was forbearing and yet manly to the last degree. While he betrayed no fear even in view of the fearful odds arrayed against him, he commanded his temper with unwanted coolness and submitted to the grossest insults to avoid a fight. His conduct contrasted with that of his ruffian murderers, and was very different, it must be added, from his usual demeanor under similar circumstances, commanded no slight degree of public respect, 
and during the fortnight that he was suffering from his wounds, the public sympathy for him has been constantly increasing. But another element has had still greater influence in swelling the tide of public feeling. Poole was an American, and had taken an active part in the crusade against foreigners which still enlists so much of public favor. This crusade, powerful as it is in religious and conservative circles, is still stronger and more determined and earnest in the class to which Poole belonged. He and Heyer were among the fighting men of the American order as against the bullies of foreign birth, and this fact had very much to do with his death. It has been felt and believed everywhere that Poole was murdered because he was active in the organized Native American interest, because he was a very difficult man for the foreign rowdies to manage or to conquer. He has been regarded very generally as a martyr to the Native American cause, and consequently the most conspicuous among the organizations that attended his funeral were the chapters of the Order of United Americans to which he belonged, and the Protestant associations which act in sympathy and in harmony with them. And to this feeling more than any other are we inclined to attribute the immense popular demonstration of yesterday afternoon. The tragedy will result in good to the city if it is properly followed up by the authorities and the courts of law. The chief murderer seems to have escaped, and we have no doubt that he has done so through the connivance and aid of members of the police department. But other actors in the affair, men known to have been concerned in planning the butchery and putting it in execution, are in the hands of the law, and it only remains that the full measure of justice should be allotted to them. End of the Funeral of Poole Reader's Note Poole was the inspiration for the character of William Bill the Butcher Cutting, portrayed by Daniel Day-Lewis in Martin Scorsese's film Gangs of New York. In memory of John P. Altgeld, address of Clarence S. Darrow at the funeral. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Veronica Jenkins. In memory of John P. Altgeld, address of Clarence S. Darrow at the funeral, by Clarence Darrow. In the great flood of human life that is spawned upon the earth, it is not often that a man is born. The friend and comrade that we mourn today was formed of that infinitely rare mixture that now and then, at long, long intervals, combines to make a man. John P. Altgeld was one of the rarest souls who ever lived and died. He was a humble birth, a fearless life, and a dramatic fitting death. We who knew him, we who loved him, we who rallied to his many hopeless calls, we who dared to praise him while his heart still beat, cannot yet feel that we shall ever hear his voice again. John P. Altgeld was a soldier tried and true, not a soldier clad in uniform, decked with spangles and led by fife and drum in the mad intoxication of the battlefield. Such soldiers have not been rare upon the earth in any land or age. John P. Altgeld was a soldier in the everlasting struggle of the human race for liberty and justice on the earth. From the first awakening of his young mind until the last relentless summons came, he was a soldier who had no rest or furlough, who was ever on the field in the forefront of the deadliest and most hopeless spot, whom none but death could muster out. Liberty, the relentless goddess, had turned her fateful smile on John P. Altgeld's face when he was but a child, and to this first fond love he was faithful unto death. Liberty is the most jealous and exacting mistress that can beguile the brain and soul of man. She will have nothing from him who will not give her all. She knows that his pretend love serves but to betray. 
but when once the fierce heat of her quenchless lustrous eyes have burned into the victim's heart he will know no other smile but hers liberty will have none but the great devoted souls and by her glorious visions her lavish promises her boundless hopes her infinitely witching charms she lures these victims over hard and stony ways by desolate and dangerous paths through misery obloquy and want to a martyr's cruel death to-day we pay our last sad homage to the most devoted lover the most abject slave the fondest wildest dreamiest victim that ever gave his life to liberty's immortal cause in the history of the country where he lived and died the life and works of our devoted dead will one day shine in words of everlasting light when the bitter feelings of the hour have passed away when the mad and poisonous fever of commercialism shall have run its course when conscience and honor and justice and liberty shall once more ascend the throne from which the shameless brazen goddess of power and wealth have driven her away then this man we knew and loved will find his rightful place in the minds and hearts of the cruel unwilling world he served no purer patriot ever lived than the friend we lay at rest to-day his patriotism was not paraded in the public marts or bartered in the stalls for gold his patriotism was of that pure ideal mould that placed the love of man above the love of self john p altgeld was always and at all times a lover of his fellow man those who reviled him have tried to teach the world that he was bitter and relentless that he hated more than loved we who knew the man we who had clasped his hand and heard his voice and looked into his smiling face we who knew his life of kindness of charity of infinite pity to the outcast and the weak we who knew his human heart could never be deceived a truer greater gentler kindlier soul has never lived and died and the fierce bitterness and hatred that sought to destroy this great grand soul had but one cause the fact that he really loved his fellow man as a youth our dead chieftain risked his life for the cause of the black man whom he always loved as a lawyer he was wise and learned impatient with the forms and machinery which courts and legislatures and lawyers have woven to strangle justice through expense and ceremony and delay as a judge he found a legal way to do what seemed right to him and if he could not find a legal way he found a way as a governor of a great state he ruled wisely and well a governor elected by the greatest personal triumph of any governor ever chosen by the state he fearlessly and knowingly bared his devoted head to the fiercest most vindictive criticism ever heaped upon a public man because he loved justice and dared to do the right in the days now past john p altgeld our loving peerless chief in scorn and derision was called john pardon altgeld by those who would destroy his power we who stand to-day around his bier and mourn the brave and loving friend are glad to adopt this name if in the infinite economy of nature there shall be another land where crooked paths shall be made straight where heaven's justice shall review the judgments of the earth if there shall be a great wise humane judge before whom the sons of men shall come we can hope for nothing better for ourselves than to pass into that infinite presence as the comrades and friends of john pardon altgeld who opened the prison doors and set the captive free even admirers have seldom understood the real character of this great human man these were sometimes wont to feel that the fierce bitterness of the world that assailed him fell on deaf ears and an unresponsive soul they did not know the man and they do not feel the subtleties of human life it was not a callous heart that so often led him to brave the most violent and malicious hate it was not a callous heart it was a devoted soul he so loved justice and truth and liberty and righteousness that all the terrors that the earth could hold were less than the condemnation of his own conscience 
for an act that was cowardly or mean. John P. Altgeld, like many of the earth's great souls, was a solitary man. Life to him was serious and earnest, an endless tragedy. The earth was a great hospital of sick, wounded, and suffering, and he a devoted surgeon, who had no right to waste one moment's time, and whose duty was to cure them all. While he loved his friends, he yet could work without them, he could live without them, he could bid them one by one good-bye when their courage failed to follow where he led, and he could go alone out into the silent night, and looking upward at the changeless stars, could find communion there. My dear dead friend, long and well have we known you, devotedly have followed you, implicitly have trusted you, fondly have loved you. Beside your bier we now must say farewell. The heartless call has come, and we must stagger on the best we can alone. In the darkest hours we will look in vain for your loved form. We will listen hopelessly for your devoted fearless voice. But though we lay you in the grave and hide you from the sight of man, your brave words still will speak for the poor, the oppressed, the captive, and the weak, and your devoted life inspire countless souls to do and dare in the holy cause for which you lived and died. End of In Memory of John P. Altgeld Address of Clarence S. Darrow at the Funeral by Clarence Darrow Recording by Veronica Jenkins in Ottawa, Illinois The Martyrdom of Ignatius, edited by Alexander Roberts and James Donaldson. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Introductory Note to the Martyrdom of Ignatius The learned dissertation of Pearson on the difficulties of reconciling the supposed year of the martyrdom with the history of Trajan, etc., is given entire in Jacobson against the decision of Usher for A.D. 107. Pearson accepts A.D. 116. Consult also the preface of Dr. Thomas Smith in the same work on the text of the original and of the Latin versions and on the credibility of the narrative. Our learned translators seem to think the text they have used to be without interpolation, if the simple-minded faithful of those days, so near the age of miracles, appears to us in some degree enthusiasts, let us remember the vision of Colonel Gardner, credited by Doddridge, Lord Littleton's vision, accepted by Johnson and his contemporaries, and the interesting narrative of the pious Mr. Tennant of New Jersey, attested by so many excellent and intelligent persons, almost of our own times. The following is the introductory notice of the translators. The following account of the martyrdom of Ignatius professes in several passages to have been written by those who accompanied him on his voyage to Rome and were present on the occasion of his death. And if the genuineness of this narrative, as well as of the Ignatian epistles, be admitted, there can be little doubt that the persons in question were Philo and Agathopus, with Crocus perhaps, all of whom are mentioned by Ignatius as having attended him on that journey to Rome which resulted in his martyrdom. But doubts have been started by Dallet and others as to the date and authorship of this account. Some of these rest upon internal considerations, but the weightiest objection is found in the fact that no reference to this narrative is to be traced during the first six centuries of our era. This is certainly a very suspicious circumstance and may well give rise to some hesitation in ascribing the authorship to the immediate companions and friends of Ignatius. On the other hand, however, this account of the death of Ignatius is in perfect harmony with the particulars recounted by Eusebius and Chrysostom regarding him. Its comparative simplicity, too, is greatly in its favor. It makes no reference to the legends which by and by connected themselves with the name of Ignatius. 
as is well known he came in course of time to be identified with the child whom christ set before his disciples as a pattern of humility it was said that the saviour took him up in his arms and that hence ignatius derived his name of theophorus that is according to the explanation which this legend gives of the word one carried by god but in chapter two of the following narrative we find the term explained to mean one who has christ in his breast and this simple explanation with the entire silence preserved as to the marvels afterwards connected with the name of ignatius is certainly a strong argument in favor of the early date and probable genuineness of the account some critics such as usher and grabe have reckoned the latter part of the narrative spurious while accepting the former but there appears to be a unity about it which requires us either to accept it in toto or to reject it altogether the martyrdom of ignatius chapter one desire of ignatius for martyrdom when trajan not long since succeeded to the empire of the romans ignatius the disciple of john the apostle a man in all respects of an apostolic character governed the church of the antiochians with great care having with difficulty escaped the former storms of the many persecutions under domitian inasmuch as like a good pilot by the helm of prayer and fasting by the earnestness of his teaching and by his constant spiritual labor he resisted the flood that rolled against him fearing only lest he should lose any of those who were deficient in courage or apt to suffer from their simplicity wherefore he rejoiced over the tranquil state of the church when the persecution ceased for a little time but was grieved as to himself that he had not yet attained to a true love to christ nor reached the perfect rank of a disciple for he inwardly reflected that the confession which is made by martyrdom would bring him into a yet more intimate relation to the lord wherefore continuing a few years longer with the church and like a divine lamp enlightening every one's understanding by his expositions of the holy scriptures he at length attained the object of his desire chapter two ignatius is condemned by trajan for trajan in the ninth year of his reign being lifted up with pride after the victory he had gained over the scythians and dacians and many other nations and thinking that the religious body of the christians were yet wanting to complete the subjugation of all things to himself and thereupon threatening them with persecution unless they should agree to worship demons as did all other nations thus compelled all who were living godly lives either to sacrifice to idols or die wherefore the noble soldier of christ ignatius being in fear for the church of the antiochians was in accordance with his own desire brought before trajan who was at that time staying at antioch and was in haste to set forth against armenia and the parthians and when he was set before the emperor trajan that prince said unto him who art thou wicked wretch who settest thyself to transgress our commands and persuadest others to do the same so that they should miserably perish ignatius replied no one ought to call theophorus wicked for all evil spirits have departed from the servants of god but if because i am an enemy to these spirits you call me wicked in respect to them i quite agree with you for inasmuch as i have christ the king of heaven within me i destroy all the devices of these evil spirits trajan answered and who is theophorus ignatius replied he who has christ within his breast trajan said do we not then seem to you to have the gods in our mind whose assistance we enjoy in fighting against our enemies ignatius answered thou art in error when thou callest the demons of the nations gods for there is but one god who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that are in them 
and one Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, whose kingdom may I enjoy. Trajan said, Do you mean him who was crucified under Pontius Pilate? Ignatius replied, I mean him who crucified my sin with him who was the inventor of it, and who has condemned and cast down all the deceit and malice of the devil under the feet of those who carry him in their heart. Trajan said, Dost thou then carry within thee him that was crucified? Ignatius replied, Truly so, for it is written, I will dwell in them and walk in them. Then Trajan pronounced sentence as follows, We command that Ignatius, who affirms that he carries about within him him that was crucified, be bound by soldiers and carried to the great city of Rome, there to be devoured by the beasts for the gratification of the people. When the holy martyr heard this sentence, he cried out with joy, I thank thee, O Lord, that thou hast vouchsafed to honor me with a perfect love towards thee, and hast made me to be bound with iron chains like thy apostle Paul. Having spoken thus, he then with delight clasped the chains about him, and when he had first prayed for the church and commended it with tears to the Lord, he was hurried away by the savage cruelty of the soldiers, like a distinguished ram, the leader of a godly flock, that he might be carried to Rome, there to furnish food to the bloodthirsty beasts. Chapter 3. Ignatius Sails to Smyrna Wherefore, with great alacrity and joy, through his desire to suffer, he came down from Antioch to Seleucia, from which place he set sail. And after a great deal of suffering he came to Smyrna, where he disembarked with great joy and hastened to see the holy Polycarp, formerly his fellow disciple and now Bishop of Smyrna. For they had both in olden times been disciples of St. John the Apostle. Being then brought to him, and having communicated to him some spiritual gifts, and glorying in his bonds, he entreated of him to labor along with him for the fulfillment of his desire, earnestly indeed asking this of the whole church, for the cities and churches of Asia had welcomed the holy man through their bishops and presbyters and deacons, all hastening to meet him if by any means they might receive from him some spiritual gift. But above all, the holy Polycarp, that by means of the wild beasts, he soon disappearing from this world, might be manifested before the face of Christ. Chapter 4. Ignatius Writes to the Churches And these things he thus spake, and thus testified, extending his love to Christ, so far as one who was about to secure heaven through his good confession, and the earnestness of those who joined their prayers to his in regard to his approaching conflict, and to give a recompense to the churches who came to meet him through their rulers, sending letters of thanksgiving to them, which dropped spiritual grace along with prayer and exhortation. Wherefore, seeing all men so kindly affected towards him, and fearing lest the love of the brotherhood should hinder his zeal towards the Lord, while a fair door of suffering martyrdom was opened to him, he wrote to the Church of the Romans the epistle which is here subjoined. Chapter 5. Ignatius is brought to Rome. Having therefore, by means of this epistle, settled as he wished those of the brethren at Rome who were unwilling for his martyrdom, and setting sail from Smyrna, for Christophorus was pressed by the soldiers to hasten to the public spectacles in the mighty city Rome, that being given up to the wild beasts in the sight of the Roman people, he might attain to the crown for which he strove. He next landed at Troas. Then, going on from that place to Neapolis, he went on foot by Philippi through Macedonia, and on to that part of Epirus, which is near Epidemnus. And finding a ship in one of the seaports, he sailed over the Adriatic Sea, and entering from it on the Tyrene, he passed by the various islands and cities, until when Puteoli came in sight, 
he was eager there to disembark, having a desire to tread in the footsteps of the Apostle Paul. But a violent wind arising did not suffer him to do so, the ship being driven rapidly forwards and simply expressing his delight over the love of the brethren in that place he sailed by wherefore continuing to enjoy fair winds we were reluctantly hurried on in one day and a night mourning as we did over the coming departure from us of this righteous man but to him this happened just as he wished since he was in haste as soon as possible to leave this world that he might attain to the lord whom he loved sailing then into the roman harbor and the unhallowed sports being just about to close the soldiers began to be annoyed at our slowness but the bishop rejoicingly yielded to their urgency chapter six ignatius is devoured by the beasts at rome they pushed forth therefore from the place which is called portus and the fame of all relating to the holy martyr being already spread abroad we met the brethren full of fear and joy rejoicing indeed because they were thought worthy to meet with theophorus but struck with fear because so eminent a man was being led to death now he enjoined some to keep silence who in their fervent zeal were saying that they would appease the people so that they should not demand the destruction of this just one he being immediately aware of this through the spirit and having saluted them all and begged of them to show a true affection towards him and having dwelt on this point at greater length than in his epistle and having persuaded them not to envy him hastening to the lord he then after he had with all the brethren kneeling beside him entreated the son of god in behalf of the churches that a stop might be put to the persecution and that mutual love might continue among the brethren was led with all haste into the amphitheatre then being immediately thrown in according to the command of caesar given some time ago the public spectacles being just about to close for it was then a solemn day as they deemed it being that which is called the thirteenth in the roman tongue on which the people were wont to assemble in more than ordinary numbers he was thus cast to the wild beasts close behind the temple so that by them the desire of the holy martyr ignatius should be fulfilled according to that which is written the desire of the righteous is acceptable to god to the effect that he might not be troublesome to any of the brethren by the gathering of his remains even as he had in his epistle expressed a wish beforehand that so his end might be for only the harder portions of his holy remains were left which were conveyed to antioch and wrapped in linen as an inestimable treasure left to the holy church by the grace which was in the martyr chapter seven ignatius appears in a vision after his death now these things took place on the thirteenth day before the calends of january that is on the twentieth of december sura and senecio being then the consuls of the romans for the second time having ourselves been eye-witnesses of these things and having spent the whole night in tears within the house and having entreated the lord with bended knees and much prayer that he would give us weak men full assurance respecting the things which were done it came to pass on our falling into a brief slumber that some of us saw the blessed ignatius suddenly standing by us and embracing us while others beheld him again praying for us and others still saw him dropping with sweat as if he had just come from his great labor and standing by the lord when therefore we had with great joy witnessed these things and had compared our several visions together we sang praise to god the giver of all good things and expressed our sense of the happiness of the holy martyr and now we have made known to you both the day and the time when these things happened that assembling ourselves together according to the time of his martyrdom we may have fellowship 
with the champion and noble martyr of christ who trod under foot the devil and perfected the course which out of love to christ he had desired in christ jesus our lord by whom and with whom be glory and power to the father with the holy spirit for evermore amen end of the martyrdom of ignatius edited by alexander roberts and james donaldson the martyrdom of the holy martyrs justin cariton carites paon and liberianus who suffered at rome translated by m dodds this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org introductory note to the martyrdom of justin martyr crescens a cynic has the ill renown of stirring up the persecution in which justin and his friends suffered for christ the story that he died by the hemlock seems to have originated among the greeks who naturally gave this turn to the sufferings of a philosopher the following introductory notice of the translator supplies all that need be added though nothing is known as to the date or authorship of the following narrative it is generally reckoned among the most trustworthy of the martyria an absurd addition was in some copies made to it to the effect that justin died by means of hemlock some have thought it necessary on account of this story to conceive of two justins one of whom the celebrated defender of the christian faith whose writings are given in this volume died through poison while the other suffered in the way here described along with several of his friends but the description of justin given in the following account is evidently such as compels us to refer it to the famous apologist and martyr of the second century the martyrdom of the holy martyrs justin cariton carites paean and liberianus who suffered at rome chapter one examination of justin by the prefect in the time of the lawless partisans of idolatry wicked decrees were passed against the godly christians in town and country to force them to offer libations to vain idols and accordingly the holy men having been apprehended were brought before the prefect of rome rusticus by name and when they had been brought before his judgment seat said to justin obey the gods at once and submit to the kings justin said to obey the commandments of our saviour jesus christ is worthy neither of blame nor of condemnation rusticus the prefect said what kind of doctrines do you profess justin said i have endeavored to learn all doctrines but i have acquiesced at last in the true doctrines those namely of the christians even though they do not please those who hold false opinions rusticus the prefect said are those the doctrines that please you you utterly wretched man justin said yes since i adhere to them with right dogma rusticus the prefect said what is the dogma justin said that according to which we worship the god of the christians whom we reckon to be one from the beginning the maker and fashioner of the whole creation visible and invisible and the lord jesus christ the son of god who had also been preached beforehand by the prophets as about to be present with the race of men the herald of salvation and teacher of good disciples and i being a man think that what i can say is insignificant in comparison with his boundless divinity acknowledging a certain prophetic power since it was prophesied concerning him of whom now i say that he is the son of god for i know that of old the prophets foretold his appearance among men chapter two examination of justin continued rusticus the prefect said where do you assemble justin said where each one chooses and can for do you fancy that we all meet in the very same place not so because the god of the christians is not circumscribed by place but being invisible fills heaven and earth and everywhere is worshipped and glorified by the faithful rusticus the prefect said 
Tell me where you assemble, or into what place do you collect your followers? Justin said, I live above one Martinus at the Timotinian bath, and during the whole time, and I am now living in Rome for the second time, I am unaware of any other meeting than his. And if any one wished to come to me, I communicated to him the doctrines of truth. Rustica said, Are you not then a Christian? Justin said, Yes, I am a Christian. Chapter 3 Examination of Caraton and Others Then said the prefect Rusticus to Caraton, Tell me further, Caraton, are you also a Christian? Caraton said, I am a Christian by the command of God. Rusticus the prefect asked the woman Carito, What say you, Carito? Carito said, I am a Christian by the grace of God. Rusticus said to Eulpistus, And what are you? Eulpistus, the servant of Caesar, answered, I too am a Christian, having been freed by Christ, and by the grace of Christ I partake of the same hope. Rusticus the prefect said to Hyrax, And you? Are you a Christian? Hyrax said, Yes, I am a Christian, for I revere and worship the same God. Rusticus the prefect said, Did Justin make you Christians? Hyrax said, I was a Christian and will be a Christian. And Paean stood up and said, I too am a Christian. Rusticus the prefect said, Who taught you? Paean said, From our parents we received this good confession. Eulpistus said, I willingly heard the words of Justin, but from my parents also I learned to be a Christian. Rusticus the prefect said, Where are your parents? Eulpistus said, In Cappadocia. Rusticus says to Hyrax, Where are your parents? And he answered and said, Christ is our true father, and faith in him is our mother. And my earthly parents died, and I, when I was driven from Iconium in Phrygia, came here. Rusticus the prefect said to Liberianus, And what say you? Are you a Christian and unwilling to worship the gods? Liberianus said, I too am a Christian for I worship and reverence the only true God. Chapter 4. Rusticus Threatens the Christians with Death The prefect says to Justin, Hearken, you who are called learned and think that you know true doctrines, if you are scourged and beheaded, do you believe you will ascend into heaven? Justin said, I hope that if I endure these things I shall have his gifts, for I know that to all who have thus lived there abides the divine favor upon the completion of the whole world. Rusticus the prefect said, Do you suppose then that you will ascend into heaven to receive some recompense? Justin said, I do not suppose it, but I know and am fully persuaded of it. Rusticus the prefect said, Let us then now come to the matter in hand, and which presses. Having come together, offer sacrifice with one accord to the gods. Justin said, No right-thinking person falls away from piety to impiety. Rusticus the prefect said, Unless ye obey, ye shall be mercilessly punished. Justin said, Through prayer we can be saved on account of our Lord Jesus Christ, even when we have been punished, because this shall become to us salvation and confidence at the more fearful and universal judgment seat of our Lord and Savior. Thus also said the other martyrs, Do what you will, for we are Christians, and do not sacrifice to idols. Chapter 5. Sentence Pronounced and Executed Rusticus the prefect pronounced sentence, saying, Let those who have refused to sacrifice to the gods and to yield to the command of the emperor be scourged, and led away to suffer the punishment of decapitation according to the laws. The holy martyrs, having glorified God, and having gone forth to the accustomed place, were beheaded, and perfected their testimony in the confession of the Savior. And some of the faithful, having secretly removed their bodies, laid them in a suitable place, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ having wrought along with them. To whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. 
End of the martyrdom of the holy martyrs Justin, Caraton, Carates, Paean, and Liberianus, who suffered at Rome. Translated by M. Dodds. The Monroe Doctrine by James Monroe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by James Christopher. JX Christopher at Yahoo.com. At the proposal of the Russian Imperial Government, made through the Minister of the Emperor residing here, a full power and instructions have been transmitted to the Minister of the United States at St. Petersburg to arrange by amicable negotiation the respective rights and interests of the two nations on the northwest coast of this continent. A similar proposal has been made by His Imperial Majesty to the Government of Great Britain, which has likewise been acceded to. The Government of the United States has been desirous by this friendly proceeding of manifesting the great value which they have invariably attached to the friendship of the Emperor and their solicitude to cultivate the best understanding with his government. In the discussions to which this interest has given rise, and in the arrangements by which they may terminate the occasion has been judged proper for asserting, as a principle in which the rights and interests of the United States are involved, that the American continents, by the free and independent condition which they have assumed and maintain, are henceforth not to be considered as subjects for future colonization by any European powers. It was stated at the commencement of the last session that a great effort was then making in Spain and Portugal to improve the condition of the people of those countries, and that it appeared to be conducted with extraordinary moderation. It needs scarcely be remarked that the results have been so far very different from what was then anticipated. Of events in that quarter of the globe, with which we have so much intercourse, and from which we derive our origin, we have always been anxious and interested spectators. The citizens of the United States cherish sentiments the most friendly in favor of the liberty and happiness of their fellow men on that side of the Atlantic. In the wars of the European powers and matters relating to themselves, we have never taken any part, nor does it comport with our policy to do so. It is only when our rights are invaded or seriously menaced that we resent injuries or make preparation for our defense. With the movements in this hemisphere, we are of necessity more immediately connected, and by causes which must be obvious to all enlightened and impartial observers. The political system of the Allied powers is essentially different in this respect from that of America. This difference proceeds from that which exists in their respective governments, and to the defense of our own, which has been achieved by the loss of so much blood and treasure, and matured by the wisdom of their most enlightened citizens, and under which we have enjoyed unexampled felicity, this whole nation is devoted. We owe it, therefore, to candor and to the amicable relations existing between the United States and those powers to declare that we should consider any attempt on their part to extend their system to any portion of this hemisphere as dangerous to our peace and safety. With the existing colonies or dependencies of any European power, we have not interfered and shall not interfere. But with the governments who have declared their independence and maintained it, and those whose independence we have, on great consideration and on just principles acknowledged, we cannot view any interposition for the purpose of oppressing them, or controlling in any other manner their destiny, by any European power in any other light than as the manifestation of unfriendly disposition towards the United States. In the war between those new governments and Spain, we declared our neutrality at the time of their recognition and to this we have adhered, and shall continue to adhere, provided no change shall occur which, in the judgment of the competent authorities of this government, shall make a corresponding change on the part of the United States indispensable to their security. The late events in Spain and Portugal show that Europe is still unsettled. Of this important fact, no stronger proof can be adduced than that the Allied powers should have thought it proper, on any principle satisfactory to themselves, to have interposed by force in the internal concerns of Spain. To what extent such interposition may be carried, on the same principle, is a question in which all independent powers whose governments differ from theirs are interested, even those most remote, and surely none of them more so than the United States. Our policy in regard to Europe, which was adopted at an early stage of the wars which have so long agitated that quarter of the globe, nevertheless remains the same, which is not to interfere in the internal concerns of any of its powers to consider the government de facto as a legitimate government for us, to cultivate friendly relations with it, and to preserve those relations by a frank, firm, and manly policy, 
meeting in all instances the just claims of every power, submitting to injuries from none. But in regard to those continents, circumstances are eminently and conspicuously different. It is impossible that the Allied powers should extend their political system to any portion of either continent without endangering our peace and happiness. Nor can anyone believe that our southern brethren, if left to themselves, would adopt it of their own accord. It is equally impossible, therefore, that we should behold such interposition in any form with indifference. If we look to the comparative strength and resources of Spain and those new governments, and their distance from each other, it must be obvious that she can never subdue them. It is still the true policy of the United States to leave the parties to themselves, and hope that other powers will pursue the same course. End of The Monroe Doctrine Recording by James Christopher J.X. Christopher at yahoo.com Introduction to Nonviolence by Theodore Paulin This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1. Introduction on Terms In the storm we found each other. In the storm we clung together. These words are found in the opening paragraphs of Hey Yellowbacks, the war diary of a conscientious objector. Ernest L. Meyer uses them to describe the psychological process by which a handful of men, a few professors and a lone student, at the University of Wisconsin, grew into unity because they opposed the First World War, when everyone around them was being carried away in the enthusiasm which marked the first days of American participation. If there had been no storm, they might not have discovered their affinity, but as it was, despite the disparity of their interests and backgrounds, they found themselves in agreement on the most fundamental of their values. When all the rest chose to go another way, by standing together, they all gained strength for the ordeals through which each must go, and they were filled with the spirit of others before them, and far removed from them, who had understood life in the same way. The incident may have been taken as symbolic of the experience through which pacifists have gone in the Second World War too. Men and women of many creeds, of diverse economic backgrounds, of greatly divergent philosophies, with wide variations in education, have come together in the desire to sustain one another and aid one another in making their protest against war. Each in his own way has refused to participate in the mass destruction of human life which war involves, and by that refusal has been united by the strongest bonds of sympathy with those of his fellows who have done likewise. But it is the storm that has brought unity. When the sky is clear, there will be a memory of fellowship together, but there will also be a realization that in the half-light we have seen only one aspect of each other's being, and that there are enormous differences between us. Our future hope of achieving the type of world we want will demand a continuation of our sense of unity despite our diversities. At present, pacifism is no completely integrated philosophy of life. Most of us would be hard-pressed to define the term pacifist itself, despite the fact that according to the Latin origins of the word, it means peacemaker. It is small wonder that our non-pacifist friends think of the pacifists as a negative obstructionist, because until the time came to make a negative protest against the evil of war, we ourselves all too often forgot that we were pacifists. In other times, if we had been peacemakers at all, we have thought of ourselves merely as doing the duty of citizens, and in attempting to overcome some of the causes of conflict both within our domestic society and in the relations between nations. We have willingly merged ourselves with other men of good will, whose aims and practices were almost identical to ours. Since the charge of negativism strikes home, many pacifists defend themselves by insisting that they stand primarily for a positive program, of which war resistance is only a prerequisite. They oppose war 
because it is evil in itself, but they oppose it also because the type of human brotherhood for which they stand can be realized only when war is eliminated from the world. The real aim is the creation of a new society, long and imperfect though that creation process may be. They share a vision, but they are still groping for the means of movement forward towards its achievement. They are generally convinced that some means are inappropriate to their ends, and that to use such means would automatically defeat them, but they are less certain about the means which will bring some measure of success. One section of the pacifist movement believes that it has discovered a solution to the problem in what it calls non-violent direct action. This group derives much of its inspiration from Gandhi and his non-violent movement for Indian independence. For instance, the Fellowship of Reconciliation has a committee on non-violent direct action which concerns itself with applying the techniques of the Gandhi movement to the solution of pressing social issues which are likely to cause conflict within our own society, especially discrimination against racial minorities. As a textbook, this group has been using Krishnalal's Shrintani's analysis of the Gandhi procedures, War Without Violence. The advocates of non-violent direct action believe that their method can bring about the resolution of any conflict through the ultimate defeat of the forces of evil and the triumph of justice and goodwill. In a widely discussed pamphlet, If We Should Be Invaded, issued just before the outbreak of the present war, Jesse Wallace Hunam of the War Resisters League maintain that non-violent resistance would be more effective even in meeting an armed invasion than would reliance upon military might. Many pacifists have accepted the general thesis of the advocates of non-violent direct action without analysing its meaning and implications. Others have rejected it on the basement of judgments just as superficial. Much confusion has crept into the discussion of the principle and into its application because of the constant use of ill-defined terms and partially formulated ideas. It is the purpose of the present study to analyse the positions of both the friends and opponents of non-violent direct action within the pacifist movement in the hope of clarifying thought upon this vitally important question. Before we can proceed with our discussion, we must make a clear distinction between non-violence as a principle, accepted as an end in itself, and non-violence as a means to make other desired ends. Much of the present confusion in pacifist thought arises from a failure to make this distinction. On the one hand, the absolute pacifist believes that all men are brothers. Therefore, he maintains that the supreme duty of every individual is to respect the personality of every other man, and to love him no matter what evil he may commit, and no matter how greatly he may threaten his followers or the values which the pacifist holds most dear. Under no circumstances can the pacifist harm or destroy the person who does evil. He can only love and sacrificial goodwill to bring about conversion. This is his highest value and his supreme principle. Though the heavens should fall, or he himself and all else he cherishes be destroyed in the process, he can place no other value before it. To the pacifist, who holds such a position, non-violence is imperative, even if it does not work. By his very respect for the personality of the evildoer, and his insistence upon maintaining the bond of human brotherhood, he has already achieved his highest purpose and has won his greatest victory. But much of the present pacifist argument in favour of non-violence is based rather upon its expediency. Here, we are told, is a means of social action that works in achieving the social goals to which pacifists aspire. Non-violence provides a moral force which is more powerful than any physical force. Whether it be used by the individual or by the social group, it is, in the long run, the most effective way of overcoming evil and bringing about the triumph of good. The literature is full of stories of individuals who have overcome highwaymen or refractory neighbours by the power of love. More recent treatments such as Richard Gregg's Power of Nonviolence present story after story 
of the successful use of nonviolent resistance by groups against political oppression. The history of the Gandhi movement in India has seemed to provide proof of its expediency. Even the argument in Aldous Huxley's Ends and Means that we can achieve no desired goal by means which are inconsistent with it still regards nonviolent action as a means for achieving some other end rather than an end in itself. So prevalent has such thinking become among pacifists that it is not surprising that John Lewis, in his closely reasoned book, The Case Against Pacifism, bases his whole attack on the logic of the pacifist position upon the theory that pacifists must, as he does hold other values above their respect for individual human personalities. Even in speaking of absolute pacifism, he says, the most fundamental objection to war is based on the conviction that violence and the taking of human life being themselves wrong cannot lead to anything but evil. Thus he defines the absolute pacifist as one who accepts the ends and means argument of Huxley, which is really an argument based upon expediency, rather than defining him correctly as one who insists that violence and the taking of human life are the greatest evils under any conditions and therefore cannot be justified even if they could be used for the achievement of highly desirable ends. Maintaining, as Lewis does, that respect for every human personality is not their highest value, non-pacifists attack pacifism almost entirely on the ground that in the present state of world society it is not expedient, that it is impractical. Probably much of the pacifist defense of the position is designed to meet these non-pacifist arguments, and to persuade non-pacifists of goodwill that they can really best serve their highest values by adopting the pacifist technique. Such reasoning is perfectly legitimate even for the absolutist, but he should recognize it is for what it is, a mere afterthought to his acceptance of non-violence as a principle. The whole absolutist argument is this. 1. Since violence to any human personality is the greatest evil, I can never commit it. 2. But at the same time, it is fortunate that non-violent means of overcoming evil are more effective than violent means, so I can serve my highest value, respect for every human personality, and at the same time serve the other values I hold, or, to say the same thing in positive terms, I can achieve my other ends only by employing means which are consistent with those ends. On the other hand, many pacifists do in fact hold the position that John Lewis is attacking, and base their acceptance of pacifism entirely on the fact that it is the best means of obtaining the sort of social, or economic, or political order that they desire. Others, in balancing the destruction of violent conflict against what they concede might be gained by it, say that the price of social achievement through violent means is too high, that so many of their values are destroyed in the process of violence, that they must abandon it entirely as a means, and find another which is less destructive. Different as are the positions of the absolute and relative pacifists, in practice they find themselves united in their logical condemnation of violence as an effective means for bringing about social change. Hence, there is no reason why they cannot join forces in many respects. Only a relatively small proportion, even of the absolutists, have no interest whatsoever in bringing about social change, and are thus unable to share in this aspect of pacifist thinking. End of the first chapter to Introduction to Nonviolence by Theodore Pauling Read by Adam Tompkins Fragments of the Lost Work of Justin Martyr on the Resurrection Translated by M. Dodds this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 1. The Self-Evidencing Power of Truth The word of truth is free, and carries its own authority, disdaining to fall under any skillful argument, or to endure the logical scrutiny of its hearers. But it would be believed for its own nobility, and for the confidence due to him who sends it. Now the word of truth is sent from God, wherefore the freedom claimed by the truth is not arrogant. 
for being sent with authority it were not fit that it should be required to produce proof of what is said since neither is there any proof beyond itself which is god for every proof is more powerful and trustworthy than that which it proves since what is disbelieved until proof is produced gets credit when such proof is produced and is recognized as being what it was stated to be but nothing is either more powerful or more trustworthy than the truth so that he who requires proof of this is like one who wishes it demonstrated why the things that appear to the senses do appear for the test of those things which are received through the reason is sense but of sense itself there is no test beyond itself as then we bring those things which reason hunts after to sense and by it judge what kind of things they are whether the things spoken be true or false and then sit in judgment no longer giving full credit to its decision so also we refer all that is said regarding men and the world to the truth and by it judge whether it be worthless or no but the utterances of truth we judge by no separate test giving full credit to itself and god the father of the universe who is the perfect intelligence is the truth and the word being his son came to us having put on flesh revealing both himself and the father giving to us in himself resurrection from the dead and eternal life afterwards and this is jesus christ our saviour and lord he therefore is himself both the faith and the proof of himself and of all things wherefore those who follow him and know him having faith in him as their proof shall rest in him but since the adversary does not cease to resist many and uses many and diverse arts to ensnare them that he may seduce the faithful from their faith and that he may prevent the faithless from believing it seems to me necessary that we also being armed with the invulnerable doctrines of the faith do battle against him in behalf of the weak chapter two objections to the resurrection of the flesh they who maintain the wrong opinion say that there is no resurrection of the flesh giving as their reason that it is impossible that what is corrupted and dissolved should be restored to the same as it had been and besides the impossibility they say that the salvation of the flesh is disadvantageous and they abuse the flesh adducing its infirmities and declaring that it only is the cause of our sins so that if the flesh say they rise again our infirmities also rise with it and such sophistical reasons as the following they elaborate if the flesh rise again it must rise either entire and possessed of all its parts or imperfect but its rising imperfect argues a want of power on god's part if some parts could be saved and others not but if all the parts are saved then the body will manifestly have all its members but it is not absurd to say that these members will exist after the resurrection from the dead since the saviour said they neither marry nor are given in marriage but shall be as the angels in heaven and the angels say they have neither flesh nor do they eat nor have sexual intercourse therefore there shall be no resurrection of the flesh by these and such like arguments they attempt to distract men from the faith and there are some who maintain that even jesus himself appeared only as spiritual and not in flesh but presented merely the appearance of flesh these persons seek to rob the flesh of the promise first then let us solve those things which seem to them to be insoluble then we will introduce in an orderly manner the demonstration concerning the flesh proving that it partakes of salvation chapter three if the members rise must they discharge the same functions as now they say then if the body shall rise entire and in possession of all its members it necessarily follows that the functions of the members shall also be in existence that the womb shall become pregnant and the male also discharge his function of generation and the rest of the members in like manner now let this argument stand or fall by this one assertion 
For this being proved false, their whole objection will be removed. Now, it is indeed evident that the members which discharge functions discharge those functions which, in the present life, we see, but it does not follow that they necessarily discharge the same functions from the beginning. And that this may be more clearly seen, let us consider it thus. The function of the womb is to become pregnant, and of the member of the male to impregnate. But as though these members are destined to discharge such functions, it is not therefore necessary that they from the beginning discharge them, since we see many women who do not become pregnant as those that are barren, even though they have wombs. So pregnancy is not the immediate and necessary consequence of having a womb. But those even who are not barren abstain from sexual intercourse, some being virgins from the first and others from a certain time. And we see men also keeping themselves virgins, some from the first and some from a certain time, so that by their means marriage, made lawless through lust, is destroyed. And we find that some even of the lower animals, though possessed of wombs, do not bear, such as the mule and the male mules do not beget their kind, so that both in the case of men and the irrational animals we can see sexual intercourse abolished, and this too before the future world. And our Lord Jesus Christ was born of a virgin, for no other reason than that he might destroy the begetting by lawless desire, and might show to the ruler that the formation of man was possible to God without human intervention. And when he had been born and had submitted to the other conditions of the flesh, I mean food, drink, and clothing, this one condition only of discharging the sexual function he did not submit to. For regarding the desires of the flesh, he accepted some as necessary, while others, which were unnecessary, he did not submit to. For if the flesh were deprived of food, drink, and clothing, it would be destroyed but being deprived of lawless desire, it suffers no harm. And at the same time, he foretold that in the future world, sexual intercourse should be done away with, as he says, the children of this world marry and are given in marriage, but the children of the world to come neither marry nor are given in marriage, but shall be like the angels in heaven. Let not then those that are unbelieving marvel, if in the world to come he do away with those acts of our fleshly members which even in this present life are abolished. Chapter 4. Must the deformed rise deformed? Well, they say, if then the flesh rise, it must rise the same as it falls, so that if it die with one eye, it must rise one-eyed, if lame, lame, if defective in any part of the body, in this part the man must rise deficient. How truly blinded are they in the eyes of their hearts! For they have not seen on the earth blind men seeing again, and the lame walking by his word. All things which the Saviour did, he did in the first place in order that what was spoken concerning him and the prophets might be fulfilled, that the blind should receive sight and the deaf hear, and so on, but also to induce the belief that in the resurrection the flesh shall rise entire. For if on earth he healed the sicknesses of the flesh and made the body whole, much more will he do this in the resurrection, so that the flesh shall rise perfect and entire. In this manner, then, shall those dreaded difficulties of theirs be healed. Chapter 5. The Resurrection of the Flesh is Not Impossible But again of those who maintain that the flesh has no resurrection, some assert that it is impossible, others that, considering how vile and despicable the flesh is, it is not fit that God should raise it, and others that it did not at the first receive the promise. First, then, in respect of those who say that it is impossible for God to raise it, it seems to me that I should show that they are ignorant, professing as they do in word that they are believers, yet by their works proving themselves to be unbelieving even more unbelieving than the unbelievers, foreseeing that all the heathen believe in their idols and are persuaded that to them all things are possible, as even their poet Homer says the gods can do all things and that easily, 
and he added the word easily that he might bring out the greatness of the power of the gods many do seem to be more unbelieving than they for if the heathen believe in their gods which are idols which have ears and they hear not they have eyes and they see not that they can do all things though they be but devils as saith the scripture the gods of the nations are devils much more ought we who hold the right excellent and true faith to believe in our god since also we have proofs of his power first in the creation of the first man for he was made from the earth by god and this is sufficient evidence of god's power and then they who observe things can see how men are generated one by another and can marvel in a still greater degree that from a little drop of moisture so grand a living creature is formed and certainly if this were only recorded in a promise and not seen accomplished this too would be much more incredible than the other but it is rendered more credible by accomplishment but even in the case of the resurrection the Saviour has shown us accomplishments, of which we will in a little speak. But now we are demonstrating that the resurrection of the flesh is possible, asking pardon of the children of the Church if we adduce arguments which seem to be secular and physical. First, because to God nothing is secular, not even the world itself, for it is His workmanship. And secondly, because we are conducting our argument so as to meet unbelievers. For if we argued with believers, it were enough to say that we believe, but now we must proceed by demonstrations. The foregoing proofs are indeed quite sufficient to evince the possibility of the resurrection of the flesh, but since these men are exceedingly unbelieving, we will further adduce a more convincing argument still, an argument drawn not from faith, for they are not within its scope, but from their own mother unbelief i mean of course from physical reasons for if by such arguments we prove to them that the resurrection of the flesh is possible they are certainly worthy of great contempt if they can be persuaded neither by the deliverances of faith nor by the arguments of the world chapter six the resurrection consistent with the opinions of the philosophers those then who are called natural philosophers say some of them as plato that the universe is matter and god others as epicurus that it is atoms and the void others like the stoics that it is these four fire water air earth for it is sufficient to mention the most prevalent opinions and plato says that all things are made from matter by god and according to his design but Epicurus and his followers say that all things are made from the atom and the void by some kind of self-regulating action of the natural movement of the bodies, and the Stoics that all are made of the four elements, God pervading them. But while there is such discrepancy among them, there are some doctrines acknowledged by them all in common, one of which is that neither can anything be produced from what is not in being, nor anything be destroyed or dissolved into what has not any being, and that the elements exist indestructible out of which all things are generated. And this being so, the regeneration of the flesh will, according to all these philosophers, appear to be possible. For if, according to Plato, it is matter and God, both these are indestructible and God, and god indeed occupies the position of an artificer to wit a potter and matter occupies the place of clay or wax or some such thing that then which is formed of matter be it an image or a statue is destructible but the matter itself is indestructible such as clay or wax or any other such kind of matter thus the artist designs in the clay or wax and makes the form of a living animal and again if his handiwork be destroyed it is not impossible for him to make the same form by working up the same material and fashioning it anew so that according to plato neither will it be impossible for god who is himself indestructible and has also indestructible material even after that which has been first formed of it has been destroyed 
to make it anew again and to make the same form just as it was before but according to the stoics even the body being produced by the mixture of the four elementary substances when this body has been dissolved into the four elements these remain indestructible it is possible that they receive a second time the same fusion and composition from god pervading them and so remake the body which they formerly made like as if a man shall make a composition of gold and silver and brass and tin and then shall wish to dissolve it again so that each element exists separately having again mixed them he may if he pleases make the very same composition as he had formerly made again according to epicurus the atoms and the void being indestructible it is by a definite arrangement and adjustment of the atoms as they come together that both all other formations are produced and the body itself and it being in course of time dissolved is dissolved again into those atoms from which it was also produced and as these remain indestructible it is not at all impossible that by coming together again and receiving the same arrangement and position they should make a body of like nature to what was formerly produced by them as if a jeweler should make in mosaic the form of an animal and the stones should be scattered by time or by the man himself who made them he having still in his possession the scattered stones may gather them together again and having gathered may dispose them in the same way and make the same form of an animal and shall not god be able to collect again the decomposed members of the flesh and make the same body as was formerly produced by him chapter seven the body valuable in god's sight but the proof of the possibility of the resurrection of the flesh i have sufficiently demonstrated in answer to men of the world and if the resurrection of the flesh is not found impossible on the principles even of unbelievers how much more will it be found in accordance with the mind of believers but following our order we must now speak with respect to those who think meanly of the flesh and say that it is not worthy of the resurrection nor of the heavenly economy because first its substance is earth and besides because it is full of all wickedness so that it forces the soul to sin along with it but these persons seem to be ignorant of the whole work of god both of the genesis and formation of man at the first and why the things in the world were made for does not the word say let us make man in our image and after our likeness what kind of man manifestly he means fleshly man for the word says and god took dust of the earth and made man it is evident therefore that man made in the image of god was of flesh is it not then absurd to say that the flesh made by god in his own image is contemptible and worth nothing but that the flesh is with god a precious possession is manifest first from its being formed by him if at least the image is valuable to the former and artist and besides its value can be gathered from the creation of the rest of the world for that on account of which the rest is made is the most precious of all to the maker chapter eight does the body cause the soul to sin quite true say they yet the flesh is a sinner so much so that it forces the soul to sin along with it and thus they vainly accuse it and lay to its charge alone the sins of both but in what instance can the flesh possibly sin by itself if it have not the soul going before it and inciting it for as in the case of a yoke of oxen if one or other is loosed from the yoke neither of them can plough alone so neither can soul or body alone affect anything if they be unyoked from their communion and if it is the flesh that is the sinner then on its account alone did the saviour come as he says i am not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance since then the flesh has been proved to be valuable in the sight of god and glorious above all his works it would very justly be saved by him we must meet therefore those who say that even though it be the special handiwork of god and beyond all else valued by him 
it would not immediately follow that it has the promise of the resurrection yet is it not absurd that that which has been produced with such circumstance and which is beyond all else valuable should be so neglected by its maker as to pass to non-entity then the sculptor and painter if they wish the works they have made to endure that they may win glory by them renew them when they begin to decay but god would so neglect his own possession and work that it becomes annihilated and no longer exists should we not call this labor in vain as if a man who has built a house should forthwith destroy it or should neglect it though he sees it falling into decay and is able to repair it we would blame him for laboring in vain and should we not so blame god but not such one is the incorruptible not senseless is the intelligence of the universe let the unbelieving be silent even though they themselves do not believe but in truth he has even called the flesh to the resurrection and promises to it everlasting life for where he promises to save man there he gives the promise to the flesh for what is man but the reasonable animal composed of body and soul is the soul by itself man no but the soul of man would the body be called man no but it is called the body of man if then neither of these is by itself man but that which is made up of the two together is called man and god has called man to life and resurrection he has called not a part but the whole which is the soul and the body since would it not be unquestionably absurd if while these two are in the same being and according to the same law the one were saved and the other were not and if it be not impossible as has already been proved that the flesh be regenerated what is the distinction on the ground of which the soul is saved and the body not do they make god a grudging god but he is good and will have all to be saved and by god and his proclamation not only has your soul heard and believed on jesus christ and with it the flesh but both were washed and both wrought righteousness they make god then ungrateful and unjust if while both believe on him he desires to save one and not the other well they say but the soul is incorruptible being a part of god and inspired by him and therefore he desires to save what is peculiarly his own and akin to himself but the flesh is incorruptible and not from him as the soul is then what thanks are due to him and what manifestation of his power and goodness is it if he proposed to save what is by nature saved and exists as part of himself for it had its salvation from itself so that in saving the soul god does no great thing for to be saved is its natural destiny because it is part of himself being his inspiration but no thanks are due to one who saves what is his own for this is to save himself for he who saves a part himself saves himself by his own means lest he become defective in that part and this is not the act of a good man for not even when a man does good to his children and offspring does one call him a good man for even the most savage of the wild beasts do so and indeed willingly endure death if need be for the sake of their cubs but if a man were to perform the same acts in behalf of his slaves that man would justly be called good wherefore the saviour also taught us to love our enemies since says he what thank have ye so that he has shown us that it is a good work not only to love those that are begotten of him but also those that are without and what he enjoins upon us he himself first of all does chapter nine the resurrection of christ proves that the body rises if he had no need of the flesh why did he heal it and what is most forcible of all he raised the dead why was it not to show what the resurrection should be how then did he raise the dead their souls or their bodies manifestly both if the resurrection were only spiritual it was requisite that he in raising the dead should show the body lying apart by itself and the soul living apart by itself 
but now he did not do so but raised the body confirming in it the promise of life why did he rise in the flesh in which he suffered unless to show the resurrection of the flesh and wishing to confirm this when his disciples did not know whether to believe he had truly risen in the body and were looking upon him and doubting he said to them ye have not yet faith see that it is i and he let them handle him and showed them the prints of the nails in his hands and when they were by every kind of proof persuaded that it was himself and in the body they asked him to eat with them that they might thus still more accurately ascertain that he had in verity risen bodily and he did eat honeycomb and fish and when he had thus shown them that there is truly a resurrection of the flesh wishing to show them this also that it is not impossible for flesh to ascend into heaven as he had said that our dwelling place is in heaven he was taken up into heaven while they beheld as he was in the flesh if therefore after all that has been said any one demand demonstration of the resurrection he is in no respect different from the sadducees since the resurrection of the flesh is the power of god and being above all reasoning is established by faith and seen in works chapter ten the body saved and will therefore rise the resurrection is a resurrection of the flesh which died for the spirit dies not the soul is in the body and without a soul it cannot live the body when the soul forsakes it is not for the body is the house of the soul and the soul the house of the spirit these three in all those who cherish a sincere hope and unquestioning faith in god will be saved considering therefore even such arguments as are suited to this world and finding that even according to them it is not impossible that the flesh be regenerated and seeing that besides all these proofs the saviour in the whole gospel shows that there is salvation for the flesh why do we any longer endure those unbelieving and dangerous arguments and fail to see that we are retrograding when we listen to such arguments as this that the soul is immortal but the body mortal and incapable of being revived for this we used to hear from pythagoras and plato even before we learned the truth if then the saviour said this and proclaimed salvation to the soul alone what new thing beyond what we heard from pythagoras and plato and all their band did he bring us but now he has come proclaiming the glad tidings of a new and strange hope to men for indeed it was a strange and new thing for god to promise that he would not keep incorruption in incorruption but would make corruption in corruption but because the prince of wickedness could in no other way corrupt the truth he sent forth his apostles evil men who introduced pestilent doctrines choosing them from among those who crucified our saviour and these men bore the name of the saviour but did the works of him that sent them through whom the name itself has been spoken against but if the flesh do not rise why is it also guarded and why do we not rather suffer it to indulge its desires why do we not imitate physicians who it is said when they get a patient that is despaired of and incurable allow him to indulge his desires for they know that he is dying and this indeed those who hate the flesh surely do casting it out of its inheritance so far as they can for on this account they also despise it because it is shortly to become a corpse but if our physician christ god having rescued us from our desires regulates our flesh with his own wise and temperate rule it is evident that he guards it from sins because it possesses a hope of salvation as physicians do not suffer men whom they hope to save to indulge in what pleasures they please end of fragments of the lost work of justin martyr on the resurrection translated by m dodds
the parable of the pilgrim by walter hilton this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org a certain man had a great desire to go to jerusalem not knowing the right way he inquired of one he hoped could direct him and asked by what path he could reach there in safety the other said the journey there is long and full of difficulties there are several roads that appear and promise to lead there but their dangers are too great however i know one way which if you will faithfully follow according to the marks and directions that i shall give you will certainly lead you there i cannot however promise you security from many frights beatings and other ill usages and temptations of all kinds yet if you only have courage and patience enough to suffer them without quarrelling or resisting or troubling yourself about them but pass on quietly having this only in your mind and sometimes on your tongue i have not i have not i desire not but to be in jerusalem my life for yours in due time you will get there in safety the pilgrim full of joy at the news said if only i arrive at length in safety at the place i desire so much i care not what miseries i suffer on the way therefore only let me know the course i am to take and god willing i shall not fail carefully to observe all your directions since you have so good a will said the guide though i myself was never so happy as to be in jerusalem yet be assured that if you follow the instructions i shall give you will arrive safe at the end of your journey the advice is briefly this before taking the first step on the highway that leads there you must be firmly grounded in the truths of the catholic faith moreover whatever sins you find sullying your conscience you must cleanse by hearty penance and absolution according to the laws of the church having done so begin your journey in god's name but be sure to have with you two necessary instruments humility and charity these are contained in the words above mentioned which must always be present to your mind i am not i have not i desire only one thing and that is our lord jesus and to be with him at peace in jerusalem the meaning and power of these words you must have continually at least in your thoughts either expressly or virtually humility says i am nothing i have nothing charity says i desire nothing but jesus you must never lose these two companions neither will they consent to be separated from each other for they agree lovingly together and the deeper you establish yourself in humility the higher you will advance in charity for the more you see and feel yourself to be nothing the more ardently you will see and love jesus that by him who is all you may become something this humility is to be exercised not so much in considering your own vileness and sinfulness though in the beginning this consideration is good and beneficial but rather in a quiet consideration of the infinite being and goodness of jesus you are to behold him either through grace in sensible devotional knowledge of him or at least in a full and firm faith in him and such a contemplation of the infinite sanctity and goodness of jesus will operate in your mind a much more pure spiritual solid and perfect humility than the reflecting on your own nothingness which produces a humility much more gross boisterous and imperfect in this mirror of sanctity you will behold yourself to be not only the most wretched filthy creature in the world but also in the very substance of your soul setting aside the foulness of sin to be a mere nothing for really in comparison with jesus who is all you are nothing and until you have and feel that you have the love of jesus although you think you have done ever so many good deeds spiritually and worldly you have nothing for nothing but the love of jesus will abide in and fill your soul therefore 
cast aside and forget all other things in order that you may have that which is the best of all if you do this you will become a true pilgrim who leaves behind him house wife children friends and goods and denies himself all things in order that he may go on his journey lightly and without hindrance if your desire for jesus still continues and grows stronger so that you go on your way courageously they will then tell you that you may become ill and perhaps with such a disease as will bring frightful dreads into your mind or perhaps you will become very poor and you will find no charitable person to help you do not heed what they say but if you should happen to fall into sickness or poverty still have faith in jesus and say i am not i have not i care for naught in this world and i desire naught but the love of jesus that i may see him at peace in jerusalem if it should ever happen that through some of these temptations and your own weakness you waver and perhaps fall into sin and thus lose the way for a time return as soon as possible to the right path by using such remedies as the church ordains do not think of your past sins for that will harm you and favor your enemies but make haste to go on your way as if nothing happened think only of jesus and of your desire to gain his love and nothing will harm you finally when your enemies see that you are so determined that neither sickness fancies poverty life death nor sins discourage you but that you will continue to seek the love of jesus and nothing else by continuing your prayer and other spiritual works they will grow enraged and will not spare you the most cruel abuse they will make their most dangerous assault by bringing before you all your good deeds and virtues showing that all men praise love and honor you for your sanctity this they will do to make you vain and proud but if you offer your life to jesus you will consider all this flattery and falsehood as deadly poison to your soul and will cast it from you in order to shun such temptations renounce all vain thoughts and think of jesus only resolving to know and love him after you have accustomed yourself to think of him alone any thoughts not relating to him will be unwelcome and painful to you if there is any work you are obliged to do for yourself or neighbor fail not to do it as soon and as well as you can lest by delaying it may distract your thoughts from jesus if it is unnecessary work do not think about it but dismiss it from your thoughts saying i am not i can do not i have not and i desire not but jesus and his love it will be necessary for you as for all other pilgrims to take on the way sleep and refreshments and sometimes innocent recreation but if you use discretion in these things although they seem to delay you they will give you strength and courage to continue on your journey to conclude remember that your principal aim and indeed only business is to give your thoughts to the desire of jesus and to strengthen this desire by daily prayer and other spiritual works and whatever you find suitable to increase that desire be it praying or reading speaking or being silent working or resting make use of it as long as your soul finds delight in it and as long as it increases the desire of having and enjoying nothing but the love of jesus and the blessed sight of jesus in true peace in jerusalem be assured that this good desire thus cherished and continually increased will bring you safely to the end of your pilgrimage observing these instructions you are in the right path to jerusalem to proceed on this journey it is necessary to do inwardly and outwardly such works as are suitable to your condition and such as will help to increase in you the gracious desire that you have to love jesus only no matter what your works are whether thinking reading preaching laboring etc if you find that they draw your mind from worldly vanity and strengthen your heart and will more to the love of jesus it is good and profitable for you to pursue them but if through custom you find such works in time lose their power and virtue to increase this love 
Cast them aside and try some other works which you think will gain for you more grace and sanctity. For, although the inclination and desire of your heart for Jesus should never change, nevertheless the spiritual works you practice, such as prayer, reading, etc., in order to feed and strengthen this desire, may well be changed according as you feel your spiritual welfare will be benefited by this change. Therefore, lest you hinder the freedom of your heart to love Jesus, do not think that because you have accustomed yourself to a certain form of devotion that you cannot change it for a better. Before you have journeyed far, you must expect enemies of all kinds who will surround you and busily endeavor to hinder you from going forward. Indeed, if they can by any means, they will, either by persuasions, flatteries, or violence, force you to return to your former habits of sinfulness. For there is nothing annoys them so much as to see a resolute desire to love Jesus and to labor to find him. Consequently, they will conspire to drive out of your heart that good desire and love in which all virtues are comprised. The first enemies that will assault you will be the desires of the flesh and vain fears of your corrupt heart. Joined with these will be unclean spirits which, with sights and temptations, will seek to entice you to them and draw you from Jesus. But do not believe anything they say, but betake yourself to your old and only secure remedy, answering, I am not, I have not, and I desire not, but only the love of Jesus. If they endeavor to put dreads and doubts into your mind and try to make you believe you have not done necessary penance to atone for your sins, do not believe them. Neither believe them if they say you have not sufficiently confessed your sins and that you should return home to do penance better before you have the boldness to go to Jesus. You are sufficiently acquitted of your sins and there is no need at all that you should delay in order to ransack your conscience, for this will now but harm you, and either put you entirely out of your way, or at least unprofitably delay your toil. If they tell you that you are not worthy to have the love of Jesus or to see Jesus, and that on that account you ought not to be so presumptuous as to desire and seek it, do not believe them, but go on saying, It is not because I am worthy but because I am unworthy, that I desire to have the love of Jesus. For once having that, I should become worthy. Therefore I will never cease desiring it until I have obtained it. I was created for this love alone, and so say and do what you will, I will desire it continually, and never cease to pray for it, and thus endeavor to obtain it. If you meet with any who seem to be your friends and who in kindness would hinder your progress by entertaining you and seeking to draw you to sensual mirth by vain discourses and carnal pleasures, whereby you will be in danger of forgetting your pilgrimage, turn a deaf ear to them, answer them not. Think only of this, that you would fain be at Jerusalem. If they offer you gifts and attractions, heed them not, but think ever of Jerusalem. If men despise you, lay false charges against you, defraud and rob you, or even beat and use you cruelly, for your life take no notice of them, but meekly content yourself with the injury received, and proceed as if nothing had happened to hinder you. This punishment, or even more, is as nothing if you can only arrive at Jerusalem, where you shall be recompensed for all you have endured. If your enemies see that you grow courageous and that you will neither be seduced by flatteries nor disheartened by the pains and trials of your journey, but rather are contented with them, they will then be afraid of you. Notwithstanding all this, they will still pursue you on your way and seek every advantage against you, now and then endeavoring, either by flatteries or alarms, to stop and drive you back. Fear them not, but continue on your way, thinking of nothing but Jerusalem and Jesus, whom you will find there. End of the Parable of the Pilgrim by Walter Hilton Pirates and Piracy by Oscar Hermann This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Pirates and Piracy, a Lecture by Oscar Herman. The limitations of a lecture will not permit the discussion of the subject upon an extended scope, nor will it allow a more than cursory review of the general doings, adventures, and methods of pirates in general, leaving the historical treatment for another occasion. The Latin word piratia defines the crime, answering to robbery on land, with the distinction that it is committed upon the high seas or navigable waters generally. The law of nations has defined it as the taking of property from others by open violence, with intent to steal, and without lawful authority, on the sea, and with the stringency arising from the ever-growing depredations and the community of interests of the civilized world, the crime was made punishable by death, and jurisdiction was recognized in that country into whose ports the pirate may be carried. Piracy flourished in its reckless dare-devilry and wanton lawlessness about one hundred and fifty years ago, its most productive operations being confined to the Spanish main, over whose vast paths the newly discovered wealth and hidden treasures of the new world were carried. The unprotected state of commerce permitted these piratical invasions with immunity, and thus allowed this nefarious trade to flourish and develop unchecked and uncontrolled. By reason of this, the lawless element of the community was encouraged and allured by the visions of fabulous riches, with the attendant excitement incident to its capture. Pirates as a class were principally outlaws, social outcasts, or longshore men of a desperate and brutal character, who deemed it the more enjoyable, the more hazardous their undertaking, and who considered it safer to maraud on the high seas than upon land, in constant fear of the minions of the law. But not all pirates were of this character. Some, not inherently vicious nor absolutely depraved, had adopted this lawless calling by reason of some stigma which deprived them of their social position, others by reason of their indolence, and others from sheer necessity, who found in their dire distress the justification for the dangerous step. Whenever a band of these men had determined upon their new enterprise, they immediately seized some available ship in the shore waters, which was frequently accomplished by two or three approaching in a rowboat in the guise of purchasers of merchandise. As a rule, a vessel, when in shore waters, is inadequately protected by guards, and thus the pirates, finding the deck in their control, would overcome the watch and, with drawn pistols and threats of death, proceed to make them helpless prisoners." With practical control of the vessel thus assured, some of the number would stand sentry at the hatchways, while a signal to the shore brought the reinforcement of their comrades in crime. Should the captured crew show remonstrance or any intimation of resistance, the swords, cutlasses, and heavy chains were most effective as a quietus, and thus, with sails all set and flying the flag of the home port as a mantle to their knavery, they sailed forth to some small town in search of provisions, to dispose of their merchandise, release their prisoners, or, as frequently happened, maroon them upon some desolate island, and thus equipped and provisioned with magazines ammunitioned, they set forth in search of prey. Not infrequently the vessel captured would prove too small and insufficient for marauding expeditions upon the high seas, and unable to give battle or a spirited chase to a sturdy merchantman. In such event their operations were confined to the coastline, and the harbors, which had been located by spies as having richly laden vessels ready for the outward journey, and, having ascertained the date of departure, the ship's complement, its possible fighting strength, and its destination, a close watch was set, avoiding, however, all cause for suspicion, and, with lights extinguished, the careful, silent watch was kept till the midnight hour." As eight bells rang out upon the darkness, and the unsuspecting sailor keeping the midnight watch looked blankly into the night, several rowboats with occupants armed to the teeth would be lowered, and without a splash ride the waters over which they glided, carrying the sea robbers to the grim sides of their intended prey. In many cases the decks, by reason of the fancied security afforded by the harbor, would be deserted, and, taking advantage of this opportunity, the attacking party quickly leap over the sides, and, under the noiselessly given commands of their captain, creep stealthily to the hatchways, cautiously taking their positions so that no miscalculations might frustrate their designs. 
And so, invading below decks, with weapons poised and every fiber on the alert, the concerted attack upon the sleeping victims would be given. With one fell swoop, and with the savagery born of their nefarious undertaking, the crew would be ruthlessly butchered, some few, perhaps, escaping in the general skirmish and fleeing up the gangway, only to be struck down by the villain on guard. For the present we will close our eyes to the awful picture of torture and murder here enacted, to revert to it upon a subsequent occasion. With the crew slain, gagged, or in chains, with all possible resistance overcome, the coming of the day was awaited. And as the first faint streaks of grey broke in upon the darkness of the night, and the harbingers of the dawn sent their shafts athwart the horizon, the shift rode proudly at her anchor, silently and stately, giving no indication of the carnage of the night. The creaking of the chain around the capstan was but the mariner's music to sing the glory of the voyage to be begun, and so, without creating the least suspicion in the vessels lying round about, the captors brought their prize abreast their old vessel, transferred their stock of provisions and merchandise, if any, to the newly captured vessel, and, thus prepared, sailed grandly out of the harbour. When once again the breadth of the ocean bellied their sails, and sped them on to the unknown Argosy, the dead, vanished crew was rudely cast into the sea, without the semblance of respect for the dead. The decks thoroughly scrubbed, the scuppers flushed, the inventory prepared, and so, once again, the course was set for a port in which to dispose of their cargo. The Argus-eyed lookout stationed far up in the foremast scanned every point of the far-reaching horizon, signaling to his mates the appearance of a spar against the heavens. Then, with course changed and wheel set, and sped on by conspiring winds, they bore down upon the unfortunate vessel, displaying at the proper moment the ominous and fateful black flag and its ghastly emblem of skull and crossbones. Thus, for months, perhaps, the fitful winds and steady currents carried them hither and thither, ever alert, ever ready for combat and plunder. With guns primed and powder horns stocked, these plunderers roamed the trackless sea, at times with impatience and drooping hopes, until the sight of a large, heavily riding merchantman set their blood a-leaping and transformed the deck into a scene of feverish activity. If we recall the peaceful errand of the merchantmen, and reflect that their armature was little calculated to cope with the war-waging outlaws, it is quite apparent how gross the inequality of the struggle must necessarily be. While most of the merchantmen carried defensive armament, the unpractised, unskilled crew made the guns in their hands little more than ineffective. As the pirate ship approached, she displayed the same flag flying from the stern of the merchantman, and with the crew hidden below decks in order not to betray their purpose, the vessels approached sufficiently close to enable the pirates to fire a broadside into the unsuspecting vessel and demand immediate surrender. At times a vessel, by reason of its superiority, would succeed in outsailing the pirates, but frequently the result was most disastrous. Often a stout-hearted merchantman, seeing that capture was inevitable, would offer battle in desperation, firing volley after volley of stone shot, the pirates, stubborn, furious, tenacious, fighting with all the ferocity their natures were capable of, resulting, after a decisive contest, in the lowering of the merchantman flag in disgrace and humiliation. With the lowering of the sails as an indication of surrender, the pirates sent out several boats with armed men, under the command of a chosen leader, who at once placed the captain under arrest and demanded the ship's papers under pain of death. This request was usually, though unwillingly, acceded to. The old vessel was thereupon dismantled, the captured boat refitted, and, burning the hull of the forsaken vessel, the pirates once more set sail, with the imprisoned captain and crew in chains cast into the dark, foul hold of the ship. Immunity was sometimes granted the captives upon their taking the oath of allegiance to the piratical horde. Can we not imagine how the intense anguish and unendurable torture finally forced from the unwilling lips the fearful avowal of allegiance? We can plainly observe the purpose of the pirates in endeavouring to capture a large, powerful, and speedy vessel, for that was the only safeguard of their barbarous trade. They readily recognised that success and security depended solely upon speed to overtake a fleeing ship or to escape a powerful adversary. Their motto, he who fights and runs away may live to fight another day, was in reality the only literature the bold and adventurous pirate would comprehend or accept. Therefore, well equipped in a staunch, trim vessel, with the lockers filled, the magazines stocked, the guns aimed and ready for action, 
they were brave enough to combat even a man of war. The books are replete with the thrilling accounts of engagements and set battles waged by pirates and resisting armed merchantmen, resulting completely in victory for the black flag, which so defiantly floated from the mizzenmast. The gradual process and growth of the energetic sea robbers, from the looting of vessels riding peacefully at anchor in the harbors, to the management of large and seaworthy craft, permitting them to undertake long and seemingly endless cruises, the most daring of which being undertaken, no doubt, by that notorious chieftain, Captain Nathaniel North, who cruised from Newfoundland to the West Indies, then across the southern Atlantic to the Cape of Good Hope, thence via Mozambique to the Indian Ocean, and northward to the Red Sea, traversing the same track to the Arabian Sea and East Indies, a voyage of 28,670 miles, the toy of the monsoon, the victim of the typhoon, and the sport of the trade winds in the many latitudes. History has reserved a rather infamous niche for such freebooters as Thomas Howard, Captain Misson, Captain Fly, and Captain Kidd, whose voyages and exploits have given themes to the historian, the narrator, and the novelist. It was during these long cruises that the coast towns suffered through the depredations, plundering, and pillage, and the inhabitants put in constant fear of these sudden and vicious onslaughts. Not infrequently the pirates selected some desolate locality in which to bury their treasures and store their stolen goods, generally building a village inland well hidden in the foliage of the forests or tropical shrubbery, and perhaps inaccessible save through the devious paths cunningly planned to secure immunity from attack. These natural defenses were supplemented with a series of forts as a further protection from the incursions of the natives. The internecine wars so fiercely waged by the inhabitants of the African East Coast frequently brought the vanquished to these villages to secure protection, a safety usually given in exchange for practical slavery in tilling the ground and cultivating crops. From time almost immemorial the word pirate has been synonymous with all that is villainous, bloodthirsty, and cruel, and capture by a gang of these assassins meant indescribable torture and suffering and we will devote a few moments to consideration of these awful scenes, the sudden attacks, the vain attempts at flight, the desperate hand-to-hand -hand struggles for life, mingled with the brutal yells, interspersed with the piteous cries for mercy, followed by the horrible silence, which finally settles over the slippery decks, and the gruesome spectacle of the dreadful vandalism, as the murders proceed to strip their victims." Generally, after a successful attack, the captain of the unfortunate vessel would be placed in chains and questioned as to the cargo and treasures of his ship. A cutlass, held menacingly over him, indicated the danger of untruth, and frequently a savage gash brought a stubborn and silent captain to submission. Inquisitorial tortures, unrelieved by any mock civility, were continued to extract further confessions from the pain-racked prisoners." Devices born only of a devilish instinct and fiendish delight suggested all forms of suffering, and so the captain was frequently tied to the ship's pump and surrounded with burning combustibles, or fastened to the deck surrounded with gunpowder which they ignited, or his limbs were severed from his body and his flesh prodded with the points of a cutlass, the fiendish pirates forming a circle around him for this inhuman sport." Despite these awful tortures, confessions were often suppressed, in the hope that the pirates would allow the vessel to proceed on its way, as was sometimes the case, and thus a part of the treasures be saved. But all hope of succor or consideration at the hands of these murderers was idle. Unsatisfied with the mere acquisition of booty, these human devils, devoid of the last spark of compassion, would mete out to each member of the crew and the passengers the most unheard-of tortures which human depravity could invent, for the amusement of the captors. Some were tied to a windlass and pelted into insensibility, or perhaps more charitable death. Others were lashed with ropes and cast almost dead into the sea, or, spiked hand and foot to the deck, were exposed mercilessly to the hot rays of the sun until the features were distorted into unrecognizability. Some were placed before a gun and thus decapitated, while others were tied back to back and thrown into the waters. In fact, so low were these villainous wretches in their degradation that only the most cruel and cunning devised torture could satiate their bloodthirsty cravings, human hyenas who found rest only in the pain and shrieks of other mortals. By far the most favorite pastime was to make the victim walk the plank, or hang him to the yard-arm, a suggestion of the retribution suffered by the pirates when captured. 
No word picture can present the awful orgies indulged in by these social outcasts who continued their carnage, assault, and abuse until the last victim had succumbed. Then, directing their attention to the ship, it was quietly dismantled, set adrift, or frequently burned to the water's edge, allowing the hull to float about, a rudderless derelict. One must not form the impression, however, that this reckless lawlessness was attended with insubordination or lack of discipline. On the contrary, they were rigorously governed by an iron hand and the unwritten code of honor. A pirate entered upon the account, a term meaning piracy, by taking the oath of fealty to the cause, abjuring all social ties, pledging himself never to desert his ship or defraud his comrades or steal anything belonging to his fellows. Having thus bound him by an oath firm and dreadful in its maldiction upon any violation of its terms, the organization is completed by the selection of a captain who, usually, is the strongest, bravest, and most desperate of them all, well calculated to keep the crew in subjection. Mutiny and the spirit of insubordination frequently raised its ominous growl, to be quelled only by the fearlessness of the captain and his ability to keep his men in abject fear of his commands. It held the men in the thralls of hypnotism, and, in its efficaciousness, depended the safety of the captain and his loyal adherence. With some crews, the title captain did not convey autocratic power, nor dictatorial prerogatives, his power to command absolutely being confined only to times of combat. A usurpation of power frequently brought death as a deterrent to any aspiring successor. In those cases where the captain was not recognized as the sole ruler, each man had a vote in affairs of moment, and had an undivided interest and title in all booty. It can be readily understood how valueless the cast-iron oath of the pirate must be when occasion makes its rejection convenient, and thus apparent dissatisfaction with the captain or with his commands have frequently caused those secret plottings below deck, resulting in open revolt or mutiny. Pirate against pirate, brute force matched against brute force for power and supremacy. The severest punishment to a member of the crew for thieving from a fellow pirate was marooning, slitting the ears and nose, and depositing the offender upon some desolate island or lonely shore with but few provisions and limited ammunition. Life was little prized, for death had no terrors and life beyond this world entered not into their calculations. Their fearlessness and courage was splendidly exampled when Captain Teach, alias Blackbeard, appeared off Charleston in the year 1717 and sent word to the governor of the colony to send out to him at once a certain number of medicine chests, in failure of which the port would be blockaded by his single vessel, and all persons on boarding ingoing and outgoing ships killed, and their heads sent to the governor as proof of the execution of the threat." He also threatened to set all ships on fire. It illustrates clearly in what dread these sea marauders were held in those times, when we learn that the governor immediately complied with the demands and the embargo was raised. It is recorded that in moments of defeat pirates voluntarily have set fire to their powder magazines and were thus blown to destruction rather than plead for mercy. During long cruises, when no ships upon the horizon line varied the monotony of the daily routine, pastimes were invented, each one outrivaling the other in sheer wickedness. Captain Teach considered it rare sport to lock his men in the ship's hold, and then set sulphur afire to ascertain how long they could withstand asphyxiation. Yet his greatest bravery was displayed and herein he developed commendable Spartan fortitude, when he married fourteen times with a fearlessness highly worthy of a better purpose. His wickedness was as great as his fearlessness was unbounded, but wickedness was voted manly in a pirate, and assured the esteem and admiration of his comrades. With the progression of events and the growth of commerce, piracy waned, and gradually the black flag which had so long swept the Spanish main was furled and drooped into the sea over which it had so long defiantly floated. The European governments made many futile attempts to check the rapid development of the unlawful enterprise, and many expeditions were successful, resulting in the trial, condemnation, and execution of the outlaws on land. In England, a proclamation of amnesty was issued, ensuring freedom and rights of citizenship to all who renounced their calling, a privilege which many accepted, only to find their blood fire and yield for the wild, aimless, and adventurous roaming on the seas, which gradually drew them back to their calling and away from the restraints of civilization. 
The capture of a pirate meant death, and, as no practicable defense was available, the prisoners usually entrenched themselves behind the plea that they were kidnapped or shanghaied, and were compelled to enter into piracy for the preservation of their lives. But piracy, with its harrowing gruesomeness, its boldness and daring, its romance and adventure, its plunder and murder, its conflicts and reprisals, is a spectre of the past, and now is chiefly confined to the rivers and harbors of the Far East and North Africa. It has lost the glamour and enchanting romantic atmosphere which pervaded the career of Captain Kidd and made him the worshipped hero of every schoolboy, or which inspired the pen of a Scott, of an Edgar Allan Poe, or Frank R. Stockton, or put the charm to the tales of W. Clark Russell. For pirates and piracy are now dead, and live ingloriously only in the pages of chronicling history. Pirate's Song To the mast nail our flag, it is dark as the grave, O'er the death which it bears while it sweeps o'er the wave. Let our deck clear for action, our guns be prepared, Be the boarding axe sharpened, the scimitar bared. Set the canisters ready, and then bring to me, For the last of my duties, the powder-room key. It shall never be lowered, the black flag we bear, If the sea be denied us, we sweep through the air. Unshared have we left our last victory's prey. It is mine to divide it and yours to obey. There are shawls that might suit a sultana's white neck, and pearls that are fair as the arms they will deck. There are flasks which, unseal them, the air will disclose Diametta's fair summers, the home of the rose. I claim not a portion, I ask but as mine. Tis to drink to our victory one cup of red wine. Some fight tis for riches, some fight tis for fame. The first I despise, and the last is a name. I fight tis for vengeance, I love to see flow, At the stroke of my sabre the life of my foe. I strike for the memory of long-vanished years, I only shed blood where another shed tears. I come as the lightning comes, red from above, O'er the race that I loathe, to the battle I love. End of Pirates and Piracy by Oscar Hermann Read by Jean Bascom, Potomac, Maryland The Pursuit of Happiness by Charles Dudley Warner From Nine Short Essays This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Perhaps the most curious and interesting phrase ever put into a public document is the pursuit of happiness. It is declared to be an inalienable right. It cannot be sold. It cannot be given away. It is doubtful if it could be left by will. The right of every man to be six feet high and of every woman to be five feet four was regarded as self-evident until women asserted their undoubted right to be six feet high also, when some confusion was introduced into the interpretation of this rhetorical fragment of the 18th century. But the inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness has never been questioned since it was proclaimed as a new gospel for the new world. The American people accepted it with enthusiasm, as if it had been the discovery of a gold prospector and started out in the pursuit as if the devil were after them. If the proclamation had been that happiness is a common right of the race, alienable or otherwise, that all men are or may be happy, history and tradition might have interfered to raise a doubt whether even the new form of government could so change the ethical condition. But the right to make a pursuit of happiness, given in a fundamental bill of rights, had quite a different aspect. Men had been engaged in many pursuits, most of them disastrous, some of them highly commendable. A sect in Galilee had set up the pursuit of righteousness as the only or highest object of man's immortal powers. The rewards of it, however, were not always immediate. Here was a political sanction of a pursuit that everybody acknowledged to be of a good thing. Given a heart-aching longing in every human being for happiness, here was high warrant for going in pursuit of it, and the curious effect of this mot de odre was that the pursuit arrested the attention as the most essential, 
and the happiness was postponed, almost invariably, to some future season. When leisure or plethora, that is, relaxation or gorged desire, should induce that physical and moral glow which is commonly accepted as happiness. This glow of well-being is sometimes called contentment. But contentment was not in the program. If it came at all, it was only to come after strenuous pursuit, that being the inalienable right. People, to be sure, have different conceptions of happiness, but whatever they are, it is the custom, almost universal, to postpone the thing itself. This, of course, is especially true in our American system, where we have a chartered right to the thing itself. Other nations who have no such right may take it out in occasional driblets, odd moments that come, no doubt, to men and races who have no privilege of voting, or to such favored places such as New York City, whose government is always the same, however they vote. We are all authorized to pursue happiness, and we do, as a general thing, make a pursuit of it. Instead of simply being happy in the condition where we are, getting the sweets of life in human intercourse hour by hour as the bees take honey from every flower that opens in the summer air, finding happiness in the well-filled and orderly mind, in the sane and enlightened spirit, in the self that has become what the self should be, we say that tomorrow, next year, in 10 or 20 or 30 years, when we have arrived at certain coveted possessions or situation, we will be happy. Some philosophers dignify this postponement with the name of hope. Sometimes wandering in a primeval forest, in all the witchery of the woods, besought by the kindliest solicitations of nature, wild flowers in the trail, the call of the squirrel, the flutter of birds, the great world music of the wind in the pine tops, the flecks of sunlight on the brown carpet and on the rough bark of immemorable trees, I find myself unconsciously postponing my enjoyment until I shall reach a hoped-for open space of full sun and boundless prospect. The analogy cannot be pushed, for it is the common experience that these open spots in life, where leisure and space and contentment await us, are usually grown up with thickets, fuller of obstacles, to say nothing of labors and duties and difficulties, than any part of the weary path we have trod. Why add the pursuit of happiness to our other inalienable worries? Perhaps there is something wrong in ourselves when we hear the complaint so often that men are pursued by disaster instead of being pursued by happiness. We all believe in happiness as something desirable and attainable. And I take it that this is the underlying desire when we speak of the pursuit of wealth, the pursuit of learning, the pursuit of power in office or in influence, that is, that we shall come into happiness when the objects last named are attained. No amount of failure seems to lessen this belief. It is a matter of experience that wealth and learning and power are as likely to bring unhappiness as happiness, and yet this constant lesson of experience makes not the least impression upon human conduct. I suppose that the reason of this unheeding of experience is that every person born into the world is the only one exactly of that kind that ever was or ever will be created, so that he thinks he may be exempt from the general rules. At any rate, he goes at the pursuit of happiness in exactly the old way, as if it were an original undertaking. Perhaps the most melancholy spectacle offered to us in our short sojourn in this pilgrimage where the roads are so dusty and the caravanseries so ill-provided, is the credulity of this pursuit. Mind, I am not objecting to the pursuit of wealth, or of learning, or of power. They are all explainable, if not justifiable. But to the blindness that does not perceive their futility as a means of attaining the end sought, which is happiness, an end that can only be compassed by the right adjustment of each soul to this and to any coming state of existence. For whether the great scholar who is stuffed with knowledge is happier than the great money-getter who is gorged with riches, or the wily politician who is a warwick in his realm, depends entirely upon what sort of man this pursuit has made him. 
There is a kind of fallacy current nowadays that a very rich man, no matter by what unscrupulous means he has gathered an undue proportion of the world into his possession, can be happy if he can turn round and make a generous and lavish distribution of it for worthy purposes. If he has preserved a remnant of conscience, this distribution may give him much satisfaction and justly increase his good opinion of his own deserts. But the fallacy is in leaving out of account the sort of man he has become in this sort of pursuit. Has he escaped that hardening of the nature, that drying up of the sweet springs of sympathy which usually attend a long-continued selfish undertaking? Has either he or the great politician or the great scholar cultivated the real sources of enjoyment? The pursuit of happiness. It is not strange that men call it an illusion. But I am well satisfied that it is not the thing itself, but the pursuit that is an illusion. Instead of thinking of the pursuit, why not fix our thoughts upon the moments, the hours, perhaps the days, of this divine peace, this merriment of body and mind that can be repeated and perhaps indefinitely extended by the simplest of all means, namely, a disposition to make the best of whatever comes to us. Perhaps the Latin poet was right in saying that no man can count himself happy while in this life, that is, in a continuous state of happiness. But as there is for the soul no time save the conscious moment, called now, it is quite possible to make that now a happy state of existence. The point I make is that we should not habitually postpone that season of happiness to the future. No one, I trust, wishes to cloud the dreams of youth, or to dispel by excess of light what are called the illusions of hope. But why should the boy be nurtured in the current notion that he is to be really happy only when he has finished school, when he has got a business or profession by which money can be made, when he has come to manhood? The girl also dreams that for her happiness lies ahead in that springtime when she is crossing the line of womanhood. All the poets make much of this, when she is married and learns the supreme lesson how to rule by obeying. It is only when the girl and the boy look back upon the years of adolescence that they realize how happy they might have been then if they had only known they were happy and did not need to go in pursuit of happiness. The pitiful part of this inalienable right to the pursuit of happiness is, however, that most men interpret it to mean the pursuit of wealth and strive for that always postponing being happy until they get a fortune, and if they are lucky in that, find at the end that the happiness has somehow eluded them, that in short they have not cultivated that in themselves that alone can bring happiness. More than that, they have lost the power of the enjoyment of the essential pleasures of life. I think that woman in the scriptures who out of her poverty put her might into the contribution box got more happiness out of that driblet of generosity and self-sacrifice than some men in our day have experienced in finding a university. And how fares it with the intellectual man? To be a selfish miner of learning, for self-gratification only, is no nobler in reality than to be a miser of money. And even when the scholar is lavish of his knowledge in helping an ignorant world, he may find that if he has made his studies as a pursuit of happiness, he has missed his object. Much knowledge increases the possibility of enjoyment, but also the possibility of sorrow. If intellectual pursuits contribute to an enlightened and altogether admirable character, then indeed has the student found the inner springs of happiness. Otherwise, one cannot say that the wise man is happier than the ignorant man. In fine, and in spite of the political injunction, we need to consider that happiness is an inner condition, not to be raced after. And what an advance in our situation it would be if we could get it into our heads, here in this land of inalienable rights, that the world would turn round just the same if we stood still and waited for the daily coming of our Lord. End of the Pursuit of Happiness by Charles Dudley Warner Read by Susan Giza Goldenberg. Röntgen's Ray by Elizabeth Cole. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Röntgen's Ray, a story of the discovery of a light that was never on land or sea, by Elizabeth Cole. The transparent man at the Century of Progress Fair in Chicago startlingly revealed the various organs, bones, and joints of the human body to all who were fortunate enough to view this skillfully contrived invention. Three years later, at the Hall of Science in Rockefeller Center, New York, the woman of glass, with its electrically lighted organs, circulatory and nervous systems, contributed still further to our knowledge of the magic way in which nature has put together her human beings. What a boon these inventions are for doctors in explaining to patients how they have been guided in making their diagnosis. Each year the public becomes more and more intelligent in the hows and whys of sickness, and the doctor's diagnosis and treatment are no longer veiled in mystery. The man who was greatly responsible for this forward step in science was Wilhelm Konrad Röntgen. He discovered the X-ray in 1895. If we today are fascinated over the marvel of seeing through ourselves, it is easily imagined how Röntgen's discovery must have startled the world in the 90s. At the time, Röntgen was 50 years of age. He was a professor of physics and mathematics who had been graduated with a degree of Doctor of Philosophy. Keenly interested in radiation, he had been working on this fascinating study for years. He was not seeking to find a cure for disease, however, nor was he a physician like Robert Koch. He was seeking to find invisible light in his laboratory, and through his discovery of the X-ray, he gave to the world of medicine and surgery a new method of examination that has made early and exact diagnosis possible in many insidious diseases such as tuberculosis. He has saved thousands of human lives. Although born in Lenep, a little town in eastern Prussia, on March 27, 1845, Wilhelm and his parents soon moved to Holland, his mother's country. His boyhood and early school days were not unusual in a special way. In fact, he was not a very good nor interested student. Then he entered the polytechnic school at Zurich in Switzerland, where he had a most inspiring teacher of physics, Rudolf Clausius. His interest in science was awakened, and he became an exact and enthusiastic pupil. So outstanding was his ability that following his graduation at the University of Zürich, he was appointed assistant to August Kunt, a great teacher there in experimental physics, whom he had studied under and greatly admired. With him he went in 1870 to Würzburg and later to Strasbourg. Here he was married in 1872 to Bertha Ludwig, a Swiss who had remarkable sympathy and understanding for his work. In 1888, at the age of 43, Röntgen was appointed professor of mathematics and physics at Würzburg, the second most important university in Bavaria, and it was there that he made his world-startling discovery. During these years he was a popular and stimulating teacher to those pupils who were interested in his subjects, but boring to those who did not care for mathematics or physics. His reticence and modesty kept him from caring for promotions, and his name was little known outside the university. The bomb of his discovery, therefore, came with even greater force, and at first people thought he had chanced upon a miracle. For many years he had been interested in invisible energy and had carried on concentrated research in radiation in his laboratory. On November 8, 1895, the final result of his work was revealed to him. In his laboratory he had connected an induction coil to a Crookes tube. This was a vacuum tube that had been invented by Sir William Crookes of London in the 70s. It threw out light and glowed with a phosphorescence when electricity was passed between two electrodes inside the tube. To eliminate any visible rays, Röntgen entirely covered the tube with black paper and excluded every bit of light from the room. 
Then he placed on the table opposite the tube a screen covered with a chemical preparation, which gave a fluorescent glow. No visible light of any kind could get out of the tube, nor penetrate it. Because of the darkness in the room, he knew that there could be no radiation outside of the tube. Yet something did come from that tube and fell on the screen as a greenish glow. It was his invisible ray. He found that these rays would penetrate cardboard, wool, cloth, even a thick book, but they would not go through copper, iron, and other metals so well. Then he found they would penetrate flesh, but that the bones were opaque. He photographed what he saw and could scarcely believe his eyes. For weeks he had been laboring over these experiments, but the day he saw this light that was never on land or sea, his wife Bertha, as she wrote to a cousin in America, was very angry with him for not praising a good dinner she had prepared. She had finally enticed him to come to eat, but he had hurried through the meal and then, to appease her impatience with him, he took her to the darkened room where he showed her the wonders. He photographed her hand with the new ray. Her bones and the ring showed, but no skin appeared. It was a skeleton hand. She was as excited as he and admitted that he had made a discovery well worth the sacrifice of her good dinner. He submitted his discovery to one test after another, watching in his laboratory night and day to see any new developments, but every experiment he made proved that his apparatus was foolproof. Several weeks passed before he told others, even his laboratory assistants, anything about his invisible rays. A preliminary communication was given December 28 to the Physical Medical Society of Würzburg, and it was published under the title On a New Kind of Ray in the Annals of the Society for 1895. Then, after the Christmas holidays, he spoke publicly before the Society in Würzburg on January 23, 1896. The news of his discovery had got about, and can you imagine the sensation it made among all groups of people? The announcement that Röntgen had seen the bones of a hand through the skin sounded absurd. Every seat in the vast auditorium was taken by the many persons who waited expectantly to hear his address on a new form of radiation. Professors, high officials, army men, students, doctors, all were present and greeted Röntgen with enthusiastic applause. He told of his experiment and it sounded like magic. To prove his rays, he took a photograph of the hand of a famous anatomist in the audience, His Excellency von Kölliker, and it was he who proposed that the ray should be named for Röntgen. Again, great applause greeted the suggestion. The aged von Kölliker said that never in his 48 years of membership in the society had he witnessed such an event. Röntgen hated publicity, but he had to make the best of it. Every newspaper began to write about his all-penetrating rays. To a friend of his, Professor F. Exner of Vienna, he had loaned his first X-ray pictures, and that is how the story got into the public press. Suppose you had lived then and had picked up your morning paper and read The Noise of War's Alarm, the Boer War was the biggest front-page news in 1895, should not distract attention from the marvellous triumph of science which is reported from Vienna. It is announced that Professor Röntgen of Würzburg University has discovered a light which for purposes of photography will penetrate wood, cloth and other organic substances. An interview he later gave to a reporter illustrates Röntgen's own wonder at his discovery. Is it light? he was asked. No, he replied, for it can neither be reflected nor broken. Is it electricity? Not in any known form. What is it then? I know not, concluded its modest discoverer. Hundreds of articles appeared in scientific journals during 1896. Physicians saw the possibilities offered by the X-ray, but the general public was not so eager to see through themselves. Cartoons were prolific and amusing. On the revolting indecency of seeing people's bones we need not dwell, said one article. 
Throw the thing into the sea where the fish may contemplate each other's bones, but not for us. In Punch, January 25, 1896, a verse appeared, two stanzas of which showed a general feeling that here was something to make fun of as well as to marvel at. O Röntgen, then the news is true, and not a trick or idle rumour that bids us each beware of you and of your grim and graveyard humour. We do not want, like Dr. Swift, to take our flesh off and to pose in our bones or show each little rift and joint for you to poke your nose in. Early in January 1896, Röntgen was summoned to Berlin to demonstrate his discovery to the Kaiser at the palace. Here he was awarded the Crown Order of the Second Class and given the title of Excellence. Other honours came to him, among which was the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1901 and an MD honorary degree from the University of Würzburg. He moved to Munich in 1900 to take charge of the Institute of Physics, where his work was largely administrative and did not permit him to devote much time to scientific research. Röntgen never spoke again before the public about his discovery, but medical journals, electrical and engineering journals, and many others published articles on the wonderful possibilities offered to diagnosis through the discovery of the X-ray. There were many stories given out about the way his discovery came to be made, but Dr. Otto Glasser, in an article in the American Journal of Röntgenology and Radiotherapy, says that the most widely circulated account in our country was a myth. This has been accepted and described by many, but makes the discovery seem purely accidental. The episode relates how Röntgen suddenly called from his laboratory, left a glass bulb glowing with colored light on a book in which he had placed a large flat key as a bookmark. It happened that under the book was a photographic plate holder. When he returned, he took up this plate holder with others and went to the country for a holiday outing. He took several pictures and when all were developed, he found one which he couldn't understand. It showed the book, and within its pages appeared the key as a shadow. He puzzled over how this came to be and made all kinds of experiments. Finally, he placed the bulb, tube, book, key, and plate as they had been before, and found that by chance he had found his invisible light. This story has never been accepted save in the United States, and while its romantic angle appeals to the imagination, it seems wholly inconsistent with the character of Röntgen and his habits of work and study. His was a search for truth, with no desire for material reward, and as a zealous, painstaking scientist he has had few equals. The first tube to reach America went to Johns Hopkins University, and the second was secured by Amherst College. The following story of the second tube is not a myth. Dr. Kendall Emerson, a student at Amherst in 1896 and now managing director of the National Tuberculosis Association, tells of having had his foot x-rayed. He thought it was the most mysterious thing that had ever happened. Quote, the professor put my foot on a little rest in front of the light, he has said in describing the exciting event. He gave me a box to look through with a fluorescent screen fastened on the front and sight for my eyes on the opposite side. I looked and was tempted to leave the spot in a panic. Before my eyes was the outline of my shoe as a shadow on a brighter background, and I could see right through the shoe and distinguish the nails in the shoe, which showed black against the screen. But far worse than that awaited, for as my eyes grew accustomed to the dim and ghostly light, the outlines of the bones of my forefoot and toes came sharply into view. I knew they belonged to me, for I wiggled them to find out, and sure enough the ghostly bones began to wiggle too. End quote. Since Röntgen's first tubes, other students of physics and electricity have added certain refinements and worked out better methods and techniques for using them. The replacing of the photographic plate by a fluorescent screen, which later became the Edison fluoroscope, was a most important step. 
At first the X-ray was devoted chiefly to diagnosing fractures and diseases of the bone. Then physicians began to realize the marvelous possibilities offered in studying diseases of the organs. As the X-ray machine became perfected, it was used more and more in all branches of medicine. Especially has it been a help in diagnosing tuberculosis where it is so difficult to locate the damage in the lungs by means of sound and touch. Healthy lungs, which are air-filled structures, easily permit the rays to pass through, but when the lungs are diseased with tuberculosis, a dark shadow on the X-ray plate reveals where the disease is. There are various tones of grey seen on the film, and the expert can discern just how much tuberculosis is present through his ability to distinguish between these greyish tones. Today the X-ray is used in schools and clinics among children, and tens of thousands of pictures of the chests of school children are taken annually in this country. When tuberculosis is found early in life, the child has all the chance in the world for recovery. In the olden days, the disease was seldom discovered until it was too late for the patient to get well. Not only that, but the family and friends were daily being exposed to infection. With early discovery, public health is benefited. Boys and girls today do not become panicky when the X-ray machine is wheeled out, nor is it a long nor troublesome ordeal for the X-rayer or the X-rayed. There are now machines that take 150 X-ray pictures per hour and greatly simplify the cost of checking health among school children as well as industrial workers in large business concerns. Paper films are used for this rapid method and are more economical than the celluloid films. They indicate the shadows as distinctly as is necessary. Although the equipment is still in experimental stages, the future of the X-ray holds much promise. Each year sees some new step, such as portable machines and these paper films, so that X-raying has become a standardized method for diagnosis used by every tuberculosis specialist. Another and most important contribution of the X-ray to tuberculosis control is its use in following the progress of the disease, or the effects of treatment. Artificial pneumothorax, or collapse of the diseased lung, is given to many tuberculosis patients to rest the lung. The work of breathing may then be carried on by the good lung and the sick lung is allowed to rest. Follow-up x-rays are taken to see what has been accomplished through inserting the air. Many patients are now alive who, without this procedure, might have died. In countless other fields, the Röntgen ray is serving mankind too. Flaws in iron and steel castings may be discovered, thus industry is benefited. In forestry, the condition of trees may be determined through the X-ray. In art, it is used to detect fakes in paintings by the old masters. In all foot troubles, the bones of the feet may be studied to find out what type of shoe best suits the individual's needs. For diagnosis of the conditions of the teeth, the X-ray is a most necessary aid to dentists. It is also used in the treatment of certain diseases. Röntgen's great discovery is famous throughout the civilized world, but the personality of the man himself was known to few. Retiring and simple in his manner, and always modest over his contribution to science, he never allowed himself to become a public figure. His Dutch mother had taught him orderliness, and this was characteristic of every step in his research work. It is interesting to note that in an address he made at the University of Würzburg a year before his discovery, he quoted the following sentence from a professor, P. A. Kirchner, who had said it in 1602. Quote, Nature often reveals the most astonishing phenomena by the simplest means, but these phenomena can only be recognized by those who have sharp judgment and the investigating spirit, and who have learned to obtain information from experience, the teacher of all things. End quote. Certainly Röntgen was one of those who captured the phenomena of nature with his investigating spirit. Thorough, exact, and keen, his work was always reliable and his information was gleaned step by step from the taskmaster, experience. 
Röntgen had few friends, but those who knew him held him in high esteem. During the World War he suffered greatly over the distress of his country, and permitted himself no luxuries, save his well-loved Dutch tobacco, which he used as sparingly as possible. The Röntgens never had any children, and when in 1919 his wife, Bertha, who had always been very dear to him, died, he felt that there was little in life to live for. On February 10, 1923, he died of cancer at the age of 78. End of Röntgen's Ray by Elizabeth Cole Read by Avaii in April 2011「Solitude of Self – Address Delivered by Mrs. Stanton Before the Committee of the Judiciary of the United States Congress, Monday, January 18, 1892. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Solitude of Self by Elizabeth Cady Stanton Mr. Chairman and the Gentlemen of the Committee, we have been speaking before committees of the judiciary for the last twenty years, and we have gone over all the arguments in favor of a Sixteenth Amendment which are familiar to all you gentlemen. Therefore, it will not be necessary that I should repeat them again. The point I wish plainly to bring before you on this occasion is the individuality of each human soul. Our Protestant idea, the right of individual conscience and judgment, our Republican idea, individual citizenship. In discussing the rights of woman, we are to consider, first, what belongs to her as an individual, in a world of her own, the arbiter of her own destiny, an imaginary Robinson Crusoe with her woman Friday on a solitary island. Her rights under such circumstances are to use all her faculties for her own safety and happiness. Secondly, if we consider her as a citizen, as a member of a great nation, she must have the same rights as all other members, according to the fundamental principles of our government. Thirdly, viewed as a woman, an equal factor in civilization, her rights and duties are still the same, individual happiness and development. Fourthly, it is only the incidental relations of life, such as mother, wife, sister, daughter, that may involve some special duties and training. In the usual discussion in regard to woman's sphere, such men as Herbert Spencer, Frederick Harrison, and Grant Allen uniformly subordinate her rights and duties as an individual, as a citizen, as a woman, to the necessities of these incidental relations, some of which a large class of woman may never assume. In discussing the sphere of man, we do not decide his rights as an individual, as a citizen, as a man, by his duties as a father, a husband, a brother, or a son, relations some of which he may never fill. Moreover, he would be better fitted for these very relations, and whatever special work he might choose to do to earn his bread, by the complete development of all his faculties as an individual. Just so with woman. The education that will fit her to discharge the duties in the largest sphere of human usefulness will best fit her for whatever special work she may be compelled to do. The isolation of every human soul and the necessity of self-dependence must give each individual the right to choose his own surroundings. The strongest reason for giving woman all the opportunities for higher education, for the full development of her faculties, forces of mind and body, for giving her the most enlarged freedom of thought and action, a complete emancipation from all forms of bondage, of custom, dependence, superstition, from all the crippling influences of fear, is the solitude and personal responsibility of her own individual life. The strongest reason why we ask for woman a voice in the government under which she lives, in the religion she is asked to believe, equality in social life, where she is the chief factor, a place in the trades and professions where she may earn her bread, is because of her birthright to self-sovereignty, because, as an individual, she must rely on herself. No matter how much women prefer to lean, to be protected and supported, nor how much men desire to have them do so, they must make the voyage of life alone, and for safety in an emergency they must know something of the laws of navigation. To guide our own craft we must be captain, pilot, engineer, with chart and compass to stand at the wheel, to match the wind and waves and know when to take in the sail, and to read the signs in the firmament over all. 
it matters not whether the solitary voyager is man or woman. Nature having endowed them equally, leaves them to their own skill and judgment in the hour of danger, and if not equal to the occasion, alike they perish. To appreciate the importance of fitting every human soul for independent action, think for a moment of the immeasurable solitude of self. We come into the world alone, unlike all who have gone before us. We leave it alone under circumstances peculiar to ourselves. No mortal ever has been, no mortal over will be like the soul just launched on the sea of life. There can never be again just such environments as make up the infancy, youth, and manhood of this one. Nature never repeats herself, and the possibilities of one human soul will never be found in another. No one has ever found two blades of ribbon grass alike, and no one will ever find two human beings alike. Seeing, then, what must be the infinite diversity in human character, we can in a measure appreciate the loss to a nation when any large class of the people is uneducated and unrepresented in the government. We ask for the complete development of every individual, first for his own benefit and happiness. In fitting out an army we give each soldier his own knapsack, arms, powder, his blanket, cup, knife, fork, and spoon. We provide alike for all their individual necessities, then each man bears his own burden. Again we ask complete individual development for the general good, for the consensus of the competent on the whole round of human interest, on all questions of national life, and here each man must bear his share of the general burden. It is sad to see how soon friendless children are left to bear their own burdens before they can analyze their feelings, before they can even tell their joys and sorrows, they are thrown on their own resources. The great lesson that nature seems to teach us at all ages is self-dependence, self-protection, self-support. What a touching instance of a child's solitude, of that hunger of heart for love and recognition, in the case of the little girl who helped to dress a Christmas tree for the children of the family in which she served. On finding there was no present for herself, she slipped away in the darkness and spent the night in an open field sitting on a stone, and when found in the morning, was weeping as if her heart would break. No mortal will ever know the thoughts that passed through the mind of that friendless child in the long hours of that cold night, with only the silent stars to keep her company. The mention of her case in the daily papers moved many generous hearts to send her presence, but in the hours of her keenest sufferings she was thrown wholly on herself for consolation. In youth our most bitter disappointments, our brightest hopes and ambitions, are known only to otherwise. Even in our friendship and love, we never fully share with another. There is something of every passion in every situation we conceal, even so in our triumphs and our defeats. The successful candidate for presidency and his opponent each have a solitude peculiarly his own, and good form forbids either to speak of his pleasure or regret. The solitude of the king on his throne and the prisoner in his cell differs in character and degree, but it is solitude nevertheless. We ask no sympathy from others in the anxiety and agony of a broken friendship or shattered love. When death sunders our nearest ties, alone we sit in the shadows of our affliction. Alike mid the greatest triumphs and darkest tragedies of life we walk alone. On the divine heights of human attainments, eulogized and worshipped as a hero or saint, we stand alone. In ignorance, poverty, and vice, as a pauper or criminal, alone we starve or steal. Alone we suffer the sneers and rebuffs of our fellows. Alone we are hunted and hounded through dark courts and alleys, in byways and highways. Alone we stand in the judgment seat. Alone in the prison cell we lament our crimes and misfortunes. Alone we expiate them on the gallows. In hours like these we realize the awful solitude of individual life, its pains, its penalties, its responsibilities, hours in which the youngest and most helpless are thrown on their own resources for guidance and consolation. Seeing then that life must ever be a march and a battle, that each soldier must be equipped for his own protection, it is the height of cruelty to rob the individual of a single natural right. To throw obstacle in the way of a complete education is like putting out the eyes, to deny the rights of property like cutting off the hands. To deny political equality is to rob the ostracized of all self-respect, 
of credit in the marketplace, of recompense in the world of work, of a voice among those who make and administer the law, a choice in the jury before whom they are tried, and in the judge who decides their punishment. Shakespeare's play of Titus and Andronicus contains a terrible satire on woman's position in the nineteenth century. Rude men, the play tells us, seized the king's daughter, cut out her tongue, cut off her hands, then bade her go call for water and wash her hands. What a picture of woman's position! Robbed of her natural rights, handicapped by law and custom at every turn, yet compelled to fight her own battles, and in the emergencies of life to fall back on herself for protection. The girl of sixteen, thrown on the world to support herself, to make her own place in society, to resist the temptations that surround her and maintain a spotless integrity, must do all this by native force or superior education. She does not acquire this power by being trained to trust others and distrust herself. If she wearies of the struggle, finding it hard work to swim upstream, and allows herself to drift with the current, she will find plenty of company, but not one to share her misery in the hour of her deepest humiliation. If she try to retrieve her position, to conceal the past, her life is hedged about with fears, lest willing hands should tear the veil from what she fain would hide. Young and friendless, she knows the bitter solitude of self. How the little courtesies of life on the surface of society, deemed so important from man towards woman, fade into utter insignificance in view of the deeper tragedies in which she must play her part alone, where no human aid is possible. The young wife and mother, at the head of some establishment, with a kind husband to shield her from the adverse winds of life, with wealth, fortune, and position, has a certain harbor of safety, occurs against the ordinary ills of life. But to manage a household, have a deatrable influence in society, keep her friends and the affections of her husband, train her children and servants well, she must have rare common sense, wisdom, diplomacy, and a knowledge of human nature. To do all this, she needs the cardinal virtues, and the strong points of character that the most successful statesman possesses. An uneducated woman, trained to dependence, with no resources in herself, must make a failure of any position in life. But society says women do not need a knowledge of the world. The liberal training that experience in public life must give, all the advantages of collegiate education, but when for the lack of this the woman's happiness is wrecked, alone she bears her humiliation, and the attitude of the weak and the ignorant is indeed pitiful. In the wild chase for the price of life, they are ground to powder. In age, when the pleasures of youth are past, children grown up, married and gone, the hurry and hustle of life in a measure over, when the hands are weary of active service, when the old armchair and the fireside are the chosen resorts, then men and women alike must fall back on their own resources. If they cannot find companionship in books, if they have no interest in the vital questions of the hour, no interest in watching the consummation of reforms with which they might have been identified, they soon pass into their dotage. The more fully the faculties of the mind are developed and kept in use, the longer the period of vigor and active interest in all around us continues. If from a lifelong participation in public affairs, a woman feels responsible for the laws regulating our system of education, the discipline of our jails and prisons, the sanitary conditions of our private homes, public buildings, and thoroughfares, an interest in commerce, finance, our foreign relations, in any or all of these questions, here solitude will at least be respectable, and she will not be driven to gossip or scandal for entertainment. The chief reason for opening to every soul the doors of the whole round of human duties and pleasures is the individual development thus attained. The resources thus provided under all circumstances to mitigate the solitude that at times must come to every one. I once asked Prince Kropotkin, the Russian nihilist, how he endured his long years in prison, deprived of books, pen, ink, and paper. Ah, he said, I thought out many questions in which I had a deep interest. In the pursuit of an idea, I took no note of time. When tired of solving knotty problems, I recited all the beautiful passages in prose or verse I have ever learned. I became acquainted with myself and my own resources. I had a world of my own, a vast empire, that no Russian jailer or czar could invade. Such is the value of liberal thought and broad culture when shut off from all human companionship, bringing comfort and sunshine within even the four walls of a prison cell. 
as women of times share a similar fate, should they not have all the consolation that the most liberal education can give? Their suffering in the prisons of St. Petersburg, in the long weary marches to Siberia, and in the mines working side by side with men, surely call for all the self-support that the most exalted sentiments of heroism can give. When suddenly roused at midnight, with the startling cry of fire, fire, to find the house over their heads in flames, do women wait for men to point their way to safety? And are the men equally bewildered and half suffocated with smoke in a position to more than try to save themselves? At such times the most timid women have shown a courage and heroism in saving their husbands and children that has surprised everybody. Inasmuch then as woman shares equally the joys and sorrows of time and eternity, is it not the height of presumption in man to propose to represent her at the ballot box and the throne of grace, do her voting in the state, her praying in the church, and to assume the position of priest at the family altar? Nothing strengthens the judgment and quickens the conscience like individual responsibility. Nothing adds such dignity to character as the recognition of one's self-sovereignty, the right to an equal place, everywhere conceded, a place earned by personal merit, not an artificial attainment, by inheritance, wealth, family, and position. Seeing then that the responsibilities of life rest equally on man and woman, that their destiny is the same, they need the same preparation for time and eternity. The talk of sheltering woman from the fierce sterns of life is the sheerest mockery, for they beat on her from every point of the compass, just as they do on man, and with more fatal results, for he has been trained to protect himself, to resist, to conquer. Such are the facts in human experience, the responsibilities of individual. Rich and poor, intelligent and ignorant, wise and foolish, virtuous and vicious, man and woman, it is ever the same. Each soul must depend wholly on itself. Whatever the theories may be of woman's dependence on man, in the supreme moments of her life he cannot bear her burdens. Alone she goes to the gates of death to give life to every man that is born into the world. No one can share her fears, no one mitigate her pangs. And if her sorrow is greater than she can bear, alone she passes beyond the gates into the vast unknown. From the mountain tops of Judea, long ago, a heavenly voice bade his disciples, Bear ye one another's burdens. But humanity has not yet risen to that point of self-sacrifice, and if ever so willing, how few the burdens are that one soul can bear for another. In the highways of Palestine, in prayer and fasting on the solitary mountain top, in the garden of Gethsemane, before the judgment seat of Pilate, betrayed by one of his trusted disciples at his last supper, in his agonies on the cross, even Jesus of Nazareth, in these last sad days on earth, felt the awful solitude of self. Deserted by man, in agony he cries, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And so it ever must be in the conflicting scenes of life, on the long weary march, each one walks alone. We may have many friends, love, kindness, sympathy, and charity, to smooth our pathway in everyday life, but in the tragedies and triumphs of human experience, each mortal stands alone. But when all artificial trammels are removed, and women are recognized as individuals, responsible for their own environments, thoroughly educated for all the positions in life they may be called to fill, with all the resources in themselves that liberal thought and broad culture can give, guided by their own conscience and judgment, trained to self-protection by a healthy development of the muscular system and skill in the use of weapons of defense, and stimulated to self-support by the knowledge of the business world and the pleasure that pecuniary independence must ever give, when women are trained in this way they will, in a measure, be fitted for those hours of solitude that come alike to all, whether prepared or otherwise. As in our extremity we must depend on ourselves, the dictates of wisdom point to complete individual development. In talking of education, how shallow the argument that each class must be educated for the special work it proposed to do, and all those faculties not needed in this special work must lie dormant and utterly wither for want of use, when perhaps these will be the very faculties needed in life's greatest energies. Some say, where is the use of drilling series in the languages, the sciences, in law, medicine, theology? As wives, mothers, housekeepers, cooks, they need a different curriculum from boys who are to fill all positions. 
The chief cooks in our great hotels and ocean steamers are men. In large cities, men run the bakeries. They make our bread, cakes, and pies. They manage the laundries. They are now considered our best milliners and dressmakers. Because some men fill these departments of usefulness, shall we regulate the curriculum in Harvard and Yale to their present necessities? If not, why this talk in our best colleges of a curriculum for girls who are crowding into the trades and professions, teachers in all our public schools rapidly hiring more lucrative and honorable positions in life? They are showing, too, their calmness and courage in the most trying hours of human experience. You have probably all read in the daily papers of the terrible storm in the Bay of Biscay, when a tidal wave brought havoc on the shore, wrecking vessels, unroofing houses, and carrying destruction everywhere. Among other buildings, the women's prison was demolished. Those who escaped saw men struggling to reach the shore. They promptly, by clasping hands, made a chain of themselves, and pushed out into the sea, again and again, at the risk of their lives, until they brought six men to shore, carried them to a shelter, and did all in their power for their comfort and protection. What a special school of training could have prepared these women for this sublime moment of their lives? In times like this, humanity rises above all college curriculums, and recognizes nature as the greatest of all teachers in the hour of danger and death. Women are already the equals of men, in the whole realm of thought, in art, science, literature, and government. With telescope vision, they explore the starry firmament and bring back the history of the planetary world. With chart and compass, they pilot ships across the mighty deep, and with skillful finger send electric messages round the globe. In galleries of art, the beauties of nature and the virtues of humanity are immortalized by them on their canvas, and by their inspired touch, dull blocks of marble are transformed into angels of light. In music they speak again the language of Mendelssohn, Beethoven, Chopin, Schumann, and are worthy interpreters of their great thoughts. The poetry and novels of the century are theirs, and they have touched the keynote of reform in religion, politics, and social life. They fill the editor's and professor's chair, and plead at the bar of justice, walk the wards of the hospital, and speak from the pulpit and the platform. Such is the type of womanhood that an enlightened public sentiment welcomes today, and such the triumph of the facts of life over the false theories of the past. Is it, then, consistent to hold the developed woman of this day within the same narrow political limits as the dame with the spinning wheel and knitting needle occupied in the past? No, no. Machinery has taken the labors of woman as well as man on its tireless shoulders. The loom and the spinning wheel are but dreams of the past, the pen, the brush, the easel, the chisel, have taken their places, while the hopes and ambitions of women are essentially changed. We see reason sufficient in the outer conditions of human being for individual liberty and development, but when we consider the self-dependence of every human soul, we see the need of courage, judgment, and the exercise of every faculty of mind and body, strengthened and developed by use, in woman as well as man. Whatever may be said of man's protecting power in ordinary conditions, mid all the terrible disasters by land and sea, in the supreme moments of danger, alone woman must ever meet the horrors of the situation. The angel of death ever makes no royal pathway for her. Man's love and sympathy enter only into the sunshine of our lives. In that solemn solitude of self that links us with the immeasurable and the eternal, each soul lives alone forever. A recent writer says, I remember once in crossing the Atlantic to have gone upon the deck of the ship at midnight when a dense black cloud enveloped the sky and the great deep was roaring madly under the lashes of demoniac winds. My feelings were not of danger or fear, which is a base surrender of the immortal soul, but of utter desolation and loneliness, a little speck of life shut in by a tremendous darkness. Again I remember to have climbed the slopes of the Swiss Alps up beyond the point where vegetation ceases, and the stunted conifers no longer struggle against the unfeeling blasts, around me lay a huge confusion of rocks, out of which the gigantic ice peaks shot into the measureless blue of the heavens, and again my only feeling was the awful solitude. And yet there is a solitude, which each and every one of us has always carried with him, more inaccessible than the ice-cold mountains, more profound than the midnight sea the solitude of self. Our inner being, which we call our self, 
no eye nor touch of man nor angel has ever pierced it is more hidden than the caves of the gnome the sacred adytum of the oracle the hidden chamber of eleusinian mystery for to it only omniscience is permitted to enter such is individual life who i ask you can take dare take on himself the rights the duties the responsibilities of another human soul end of a solitude of self by elizabeth caddy stanton the street markets from london labour and the london poor by henry mayhew this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the london street markets on a saturday night the street sellers are to be seen in the greatest numbers at the london street markets on a saturday night here and in the shops immediately adjoining the working classes generally purchase their sunday's dinner and after pay time on saturday night or early on sunday morning the crowd in the new cut and the brill in particular is almost impassable indeed the scene in these parts has more of the character of a fair than a market there are hundreds of stalls and every stall has its one or two lights either it is illuminated by the intense white light of the new self-generating gas lamp or else it is brightened up by the red smoky flame of the old-fashioned grease lamp one man shows off his yellow haddock with a candle stuck in a bundle of firewood his neighbour makes a candlestick of a huge turnip and the tallow gutters over its sides while the boy shouting eight a penny stunning pears has rolled his dip in a thick coat of brown paper that flares away with the candle some stalls are crimson with the fire shining through the holes beneath the baked chestnut stove others have handsome octahedral lamps while a few have a candle shining through a sieve these with the sparkling ground glass globes of the tea dealers shops and the butchers gas lights streaming and fluttering in the wind like flags of flame pour forth such a flood of light that at a distance the atmosphere immediately above the spot is as lurid as if the street were on fire the pavement and road are crowded with purchasers and street sellers the housewife in her thick shawl with the market basket on her arm walks slowly on stopping now to look at the stall of caps and now to cheapen a bunch of greens little boys holding three or four onions in their hand creep between the people wriggling their way through every interstice and asking for custom in whining tones as if seeking charity then the tumult of the thousand different cries of the eager dealers all shouting at the top of their voices at one and the same time is almost bewildering so old again roars one chestnuts a lot a penny a score bowls another an apenny a skin blacking squeaks a boy bye 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 cries the butcher half a quire of paper for a penny bellows the street stationer an apenny a lot ingans two pence a pound grapes three a penny yarmouth bloaters who'll buy a bonnet for fourpence pick em out cheap here three pair for a half penny bootlaces now's your time beautiful welt a penny a lot here's hairpuths shouts the perambulating confectioner come and look at em here's toasters bellows one with a yarmouth bloater stuck on a toasting fork penny a lot fine russets calls the apple woman and so the babel goes on one man stands with his red-edged mats hanging over his back and chest like a herald's coat and the girl with the basket of walnuts lifts her brown stained fingers to her mouth as she screams fine walnuts sixteen a penny fine walnuts a bootmaker to ensure custom has illuminated his shop front with a line of gas and in its full glare stands a blind beggar his eyes turned up so as to show only the whites and mumbling some begging rhymes that are drowned in the shrill notes of the bamboo flute player next to him the boy's sharp cry the woman's cracked voice the gruff hoarse shout of the man are all mingled together sometimes an irishman is heard with his fine eighteen apples or else the jingling music of an unseen organ breaks out as the trio of street singers rest between the verses then the sights as you elbow your way through the crowd are equally multifarious here is a stall glittering with new tin saucepans there another bright with its blue and yellow crockery and sparkling with white glass now you come to a row of old shoes arranged along the pavement now to a stand of gaudy tea trays then to a shop with red handkerchiefs and blue checked shirts fluttering backwards and forwards 
and a counter built up outside on the curb, behind which a boy is beseeching custom. At the door of a tea-shop, with its hundred white globes of light, stands a man delivering bills, thanking the public for past favours and defying competition. Here, alongside the road, are some half-dozen headless tailors' dummies, dressed in Chesterfields and fustian jackets, each labelled, Look at the prices, or Observe the quality. After this is a butcher's shop, crimson and white, with meat piled up to the first floor, in front of which the butcher himself, in his blue coat, walks up and down, sharpening his knife on the steel that hangs to his waist. A little further on stands the clean family, begging, the father with his head down as if in shame, and a box of lucifers held forth in his hand, the boys in newly washed pinafores, and the tidily got up mother with a child at her breast. This stall is green and white with bunches of turnips, that red with apples, the next yellow with onions, and another purple with pickling cabbages. One minute you pass a man with an umbrella turned inside up and full of prints, the next you hear one with a peep-show of Mazeppa and Paul Jones the pirate describing the pictures to the boys looking in at the little round windows. Then is heard the sharp snap of the percussion cap from the crowd of lads firing at the target for nuts, and the moment afterwards you see either a black man half clad in white and shivering in the cold with tracts in his hand, or else you hear the sounds of music from Frazier's Circus on the other side of the road, and the man outside the door of the penny concert beseeching you to be in time, be in time, as Mr. Somebody is just about to sing his favourite song of the knife grinder. Such indeed is the riot, the struggle, and the scramble for a living, that the confusion and uproar of the new cut on Saturday night might have a bewildering and saddening effect upon the thoughtful mind. Each salesman tries his utmost to sell his wares, tempting the passers-by with his bargains. The boy with his stock of herbs offers a double handful of fine parsley for a penny. The man with the donkey-cart filled with turnips has three lads to shout for him to their utmost, with their, Ho! Ho! Hi! 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 What do you think of this here? A penny a bunch! Hooray for free trade! Here's your turnips! Until it is seen and heard, we have no sense of the scramble that is going on throughout London for a living. The same scene takes place at the Brill, the same in Leather Lane, the same in Tottenham Court Road, the same in Whitecross Street. Go to whatever corner of the metropolis you please, either on a Saturday night or a Sunday morning, and there is the same shouting and the same struggling to get the penny profit out of the poor man's Sunday's dinner. Since the above description was written, the new cut has lost much of its noisy and brilliant glory. In consequence of a new police regulation, stands or pitches have been forbidden, and each coster on a market night is now obliged, under pain of the lock-up house, to carry his tray, or keep moving with his barrow. The gay stalls have been replaced by deal boards, some sodden with wet fish, others stained purple with blackberries, or brown with walnut peel and the bright lamps are almost totally superseded by the dim, guttering candle. Even if the pole under the tray or shallow is seen resting on the ground, the policeman on duty is obliged to interfere. The mob of purchasers has diminished one half, and instead of the road being filled with customers and trucks, the pavement and curbstones are scarcely crowded. The Sunday Morning Markets Nearly every poor man's market does its Sunday trade, for a few hours on the Sabbath morning the noise, bustle, and scramble of the Saturday night are repeated, and but for this opportunity many a poor family would pass a dinnerless Sunday. The system of paying the mechanic late on the Saturday night, and more particularly of paying a man his wages in a public house, when he is tired with his day's work, lures him to the tavern, and there the hours fly quickly enough beside the warm tap-room fire, so that by the time the wife comes for her husband's wages she finds a large portion of them gone in drink, and the streets half cleared, so that the Sunday market is the only chance of getting the Sunday's dinner. Of all these Sunday morning markets, the Brill perhaps furnishes the busiest scene, so that it may be taken as a type of the hall. The streets in the neighbourhood are quiet and empty, the shops are closed with their different coloured shutters, and the people round about are dressed in the shiny cloth of the holiday suit. There are no cabs, and but few omnibuses to disturb the rest and men walk in the road as safely as on the footpath. As you enter the Brill, the market sounds are scarcely heard, but at each step the low hum grows gradually into the noisy shouting, 
until at last the different cries become distinct, and the hubbub, din, and confusion of a thousand voices bellowing at once again fill the air. The road and footpath are crowded as on the overnight. The men are standing in groups, smoking and talking, whilst the women run to and fro, some with the white round turnips showing out of their filled aprons, others with cabbages under their arms, and a piece of red meat dangling from their hands. Only a few of the shops are closed, but the butchers and the coal-shed are filled with customers, and from the door of the shut-up bakers the women come streaming forth with bags of flour in their hands, while men sally from the halfpenny barbers, smoothing their clean-shaved chins. Walnuts, blacking, apples, onions, braces, combs, turnips, herrings, pens and corn-plaster are all bellowed out at the same time. Labourers and mechanics, still unshorn and undressed, hang about with their hands in their pockets, some with their pet terriers under their arms. The pavement is green with the refuse leaves of vegetables, and round a cabbage barrel the women stand turning over the bunches, as the man shouts, Where you like, only a penny! Boys are running home with the breakfast herring held in a piece of paper, and the side pocket of the apple man's stuff coat hangs down with the weight of the halfpence stored within. Presently the tolling of the neighbouring church bells breaks forth. Then the bustle doubles itself, the cries grow louder, the confusion greater. Women run about and push their way through the throng, scolding the saunterers, for in half an hour the market will close. In a little time the butcher puts up his shutters, and leaves the door still open. The policemen in their clean gloves come round, and drive the street sellers before them, and as the clock strikes eleven, the market finishes, and the Sunday's rest begins. End of The Street Markets from London Labour and the London Poor by Henry Mayhew. Read by Jason Mills. Vampires from a Philosophical Dictionary by Voltaire. Translated by Tobias Smollett. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Martin Geeson. What? Is it in our eighteenth century that vampires exist? Is it after the reigns of Locke, Shaftesbury, Trenchard, and Collins? Is it under those of D'Alembert, Diderot, Saint-Lambert, and Duclos that we believe in vampires, and that the Reverend Father Don Calmet, Benedictine priest of the congregation of saint van and saint Idulphe, Abbe of Senon, an abbey of a hundred thousand livres a year, in the neighbourhood of two other abbeys of the same revenue, has printed and reprinted the history of vampires with the approbation of the sorbonne signed marchilli um, these vampires were corpses who went out of their graves at night to suck the blood of the living either at their throats or stomachs after which they returned to their cemeteries the persons so sucked waned grew pale and fell into consumption while the sucking corpses grew fat got rosy and enjoyed an excellent appetite it was in poland hungary silesia moravia austria and lorraine that the dead made this good cheer we never heard a word of vampires in london nor even at Paris. I confess that in both these cities there were stock-jobbers, brokers, and men of business who sucked the blood of the people in broad daylight, but they were not dead, though corrupted. These true suckers lived not in cemeteries, but in very agreeable palaces. Oh! Who would believe that we derive the idea of vampires from Greece? Not from the Greece of Alexander, Aristotle, Plato, Epicurus, and Demosthenes, but from Christian Greece, unfortunately schismatic. 
for a long time christians of the greek rite have imagined that the bodies of christians of the latin church buried in greece do not decay because they are excommunicated this is precisely the contrary to that of us christians of the latin church who believe that corpses which do not corrupt are marked with the seal of eternal beatitude so much so indeed that when we have paid a hundred thousand crowns to rome to give them a saint's brevet we adore them with the worship of dulia the greeks are persuaded that these dead are sorcerers they call them brucolacas or vrucolacas according as they pronounce the second letter of the alphabet the greek corpses go into houses to suck the blood of little children to eat the supper of the fathers and mothers drink their wine and break all the furniture they can only be put to rights by burning them when they are caught but the precaution must be taken of not putting them into the fire until after their hearts are torn out which must be burned separately the celebrated tournefort sent into the levant by louis the fourteenth as well as so many other virtuosi was witness of all the acts attributed to one of these brucolacas and to this ceremony oh, after slander nothing is communicated more promptly than superstition fanaticism sorcery and tales of those raised from the dead there were brucolacas in wallachia moldavia and some among the polanders who were of the romish church this superstition being absent they acquired it and it went through all the east of germany nothing was spoken of but vampires from seventeen hundred and thirty to seventeen thirty five they were laid in wait for their hearts torn out and burned they resembled the ancient martyrs the more they were burned the more they abounded finally calmet became their historian and treated vampires as he treated the old and new testaments by relating faithfully all that has been said before him the most curious things in my opinion were the verbal suits juridically conducted concerning the dead who went from their tombs to suck the little boys and girls of their neighbourhood calmet relates that in hungary two officers delegated by the emperor charles the sixth assisted by the bailiff of the place and an executioner held an inquest on a vampire who had been dead six weeks and who had sucked all the neighbourhood they found him in his coffin fresh and jolly with his eyes open and asking for food the bailiff passed his sentence the executioner tore out the vampire's heart and burned it after which he feasted no more who after this dares to doubt of the resuscitated dead with which our ancient legends are filled and of all the miracles related by bolandus and the sincere and revered don ruinard you will find stories of vampires in the jewish letters of d'argent whom the jesuit authors of the journal of trevoux have accused of believing nothing it should be observed how they triumph in the history of the vampire of hungary how they thanked god and the virgin for having at last converted this poor d'argent the chamberlain of a king who did not believe in vampires behold said they this famous unbeliever who dared to throw doubts on the appearance of the angel to the holy virgin on the star which conducted the magi 
on the cure of the possessed on the immersion of two thousand swine in a lake on an eclipse of the sun at the full moon on the resurrection of the dead who walked in jerusalem his heart is softened his mind is enlightened he believes in vampires there no longer remained any question but to examine whether all these dead were raised by their own virtue by the power of god or by that of the devil several great theologians of lorraine of moravia and hungary displayed their opinions and their science they related all that st augustine st ambrose and so many other saints had most unintelligibly said on the living and the dead they related all the miracles of st stephen which are found in the seventh book of the works of st augustine this is one of the most curious of them in the city of aubzal in africa a young man was crushed to death by the ruins of a wall the widow immediately invoked st stephen to whom she was very much devoted st stephen raised him he was asked what he had seen in the other world sirs said he when my soul quitted my body it met an infinity of souls who asked it more questions about this world than you do of the other i went i know not whither when i met st stephen who said to me give back that which thou hast received i answered what should i give back you have given me nothing he repeated three times give back that which thou hast received then i comprehended that he spoke of the credo i repeated my credo to him and suddenly he raised me above all they quoted the stories related by sulpicius severus in the life of st martin they proved that st martin with some others raised up a condemned soul but all these stories however true they might be had nothing in common with the vampires who rose to suck the blood of their neighbours and afterwards replaced themselves in their coffins they looked if they could not find in the old testament or in the mythology some vampire whom they could quote as an example but they found none it was proved however that the dead drank and ate since in so many ancient nations food was placed on their tombs the difficulty was to know whether it was the soul or the body of the dead which ate it was decided that it was both delicate and unsubstantial things as sweetmeats whipped cream and melting fruits were for the soul and roast beef and the like were for the body the kings of persia were said they the first who caused themselves to be served with viands after their death almost all the kings of the present day imitate them but they are the monks who eat their dinner and supper and drink their wine thus properly speaking kings are not vampires the true vampires are the monks who eat at the expense of both kings and people it is very true that st stanislaus who had bought a considerable estate from a polish gentleman and not paid him for it being brought before king boleslaus by his heirs raised up the gentleman but this was solely to get quittance it is not said that he gave a single glass of wine to the seller who returned to the other world without having eaten or drunk 
they afterwards treated of the grand question whether a vampire could be absolved who died excommunicated which comes more to the point i am not profound enough in theology to give my opinion on this subject but i would willingly be for absolution because in all doubtful affairs we should take the mildest part odia restringenda favores ampliandi the result of all this is that a great part of europe has been infested with vampires for five or six years and that there are now no more that we have had convulsionaries in france for twenty years and that we have them no longer that we have had demoniacs for seventeen hundred years but have them no longer that the dead have been raised ever since the days of hippolytus but that they are raised no longer and lastly that we have had jesuits in spain portugal france and the two sicilies but that we have them no longer <laughs> end of vampires from a philosophical dictionary by voltaire translated by tobias smollett The Way to Wealth by Benjamin Franklin. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Courteous Reader, I have heard that nothing gives an author so great pleasure as to find his works respectfully quoted by other learned authors. This pleasure I have seldom enjoyed for though i have been if i may say without vanity an eminent author of almanacs annually now a full quarter of a century my brother authors in the same way for what reason i know not have ever been very sparing in their applauses and no other author has taken the least notice of me so that did not my writings produce me some solid pudding the great deficiency of praise would have quite discouraged me i concluded at length that the people were the best judges of my merit, for they buy my works, and besides, in my rambles, where I am not personally known, I have frequently heard one or other of my adages repeated with, as poor Richard says, at the end on't. This gave me some satisfaction, as it showed not only that my instructions were regarded, but discovered likewise some respect for my authority and i own that to encourage the practice of remembering and repeating those wise sentences i have sometimes quoted myself with great gravity judge then how much i must have been gratified by an incident i am going to relate to you i stopped my horse lately where a great number of people were collected at a vendue of merchant goods the hour of sale not being come they were conversing on the badness of the times and one of the company called to a plain clean old man with white locks pray father abraham what think you of the times won't these heavy taxes quite ruin the country how shall we ever be able to pay them what would you advise us to father abraham stood up and replied if you'd have my advice i'll give it you in short for a word to the wise is enough and many words won't fill a bushel as poor richard says they joined in desiring him to speak his mind, and gathering round him, he proceeded as follows. Friends, says he, and neighbors, the taxes are indeed very heavy, and if those laid on by the government were the only ones we had to pay, we might more easily discharge them. But we have many others, and much more grievous to some of us. We are taxed twice as much by our idleness, three times as much by our pride, and four times as much by our folly and from these taxes the commissioners cannot ease or deliver us by allowing an abatement however let us hearken to good advice and something may be done for us god helps them that help themselves as poor richard says in his almanac of seventeen thirty three 
it would be thought a hard government that should tax its people one-tenth part of their time to be employed in its service but idleness taxes many of us much more if we reckon all that is spent in absolute sloth or doing of nothing with that which is spent in idle employments or amusements that amount to nothing sloth by bringing on diseases absolutely shortens life sloth like rust consumes faster than labor wears while the used key is always bright as poor richard says but dost thou love life then do not squander time for that's the stuff life is made of as poor richard says how much more than is necessary do we spend in sleep forgetting that the sleeping fox catches no poultry and that there will be sleeping enough in the grave as poor richard says if time be of all things the most precious wasting time must be as poor richard says the greatest prodigality since as he elsewhere tells us lost time is never found again and what we call time enough always proves little enough let us then be up and be doing and doing to the purpose so by diligence shall we do more with less perplexity sloth makes all things difficult but industry all easy as poor richard says and he that riseth late must trot all day and shall scarce overtake his business at night while laziness travels so slowly that poverty soon overtakes him as we read in poor richard who adds drive thy business let not that drive thee and early to bed and early to rise makes a man healthy wealthy and wise so what signifies wishing and hoping for better times we may make these times better if we bestir ourselves industry need not wish as poor richard says and he that lives upon hope will die fasting there are no gains without pains then help hands for i have no lands or if i have they are smartly taxed and as poor richard likewise observes he that hath a trade hath an estate and he that hath a calling hath an office of profit and honour but then the trade must be worked at and the calling well followed for neither the estate nor the office will enable us to pay our taxes if we are industrious we shall never starve for as poor richard says at the working man's house hunger looks in but dares not enter nor will the bailiff nor the constable enter for industry pays debts while despair increaseth them says poor richard what though you have found no treasure nor has any rich relation left you a legacy diligence is the mother of good luck as poor richard says and god gives all things to industry then plough deep while sluggards sleep and you shall have corn to sell and to keep says poor dick work while it is called to-day for you know not how much you may be hindered to-morrow which makes poor richard say one to-day is worth two to-morrows and farther have you somewhat to do to-morrow do it to-day if you were a servant would you not be ashamed that a good master should catch you idle are you then your own master be ashamed to catch yourself idle as poor dick says when there is so much to be done for yourself your family your country and your gracious king be up by peep of day let not the sun look down and say inglorious here he lies handle your tools without mittens remember that the cat in gloves catches no mice as poor richard says tis true there is much to be done and perhaps you are weak-handed but stick to it steadily and you will see great effects for constant dropping wears away stones and by diligence and patience the mouse ate into the cable and little strokes fell great oaks as poor richard says in his almanac the year i cannot just now remember methinks i hear some of you say must a man afford himself no leisure i will tell thee my friend what poor richard says employ thy time well if thou meanest to gain leisure and since thou art not sure of a minute throw not away an hour 
leisure is time for doing something useful this leisure the diligent man will obtain but the lazy man never so that as poor richard says a life of leisure and a life of laziness are two things do you imagine that sloth will afford you more comfort than labor no for as poor richard says trouble springs from idleness and grievous toil from needless ease many without labor would live by their wits only but they break for want of stock whereas industry gives comfort and plenty and respect fly pleasures and they'll follow you the diligent spinner has a large shift and now i have a sheep and a cow everybody bids me good morrow all which is well said by poor richard but with our industry we must likewise be steady settled and careful and oversee our own affairs with our own eyes and not trust too much to others for as poor richard says i never saw an oft removed tree nor yet an oft removed family that throve so well as those that settled be and again three removes is as bad as a fire and again keep thy shop and thy shop will keep thee and again if you would have your business done go if not send and again he that by the plough would thrive himself must either hold or drive and again the eye of a master will do more work than both his hands and again want of care does us more damage than want of knowledge and again not to oversee workmen is to leave them your purse open trusting too much to others care is the ruin of many for as the almanac says in the affairs of this world men are saved not by faith but by the want of it but a man's own care is profitable for saith poor dick learning is to the studious and riches to the careful as well as power to the bold and heaven to the virtuous and farther if you would have a faithful servant and one that you like serve yourself and again he adviseth to circumspection and care even in the smallest matters because sometimes a little neglect may breed great mischief adding for want of a nail the shoe was lost for want of a shoe the horse was lost and for want of a horse the rider was lost being overtaken and slain by the enemy all for want of care about a horseshoe nail so much for industry my friends and attention to one's own business but to these we must add frugality if we would make our industry more certainly successful a man may if he knows not how to save as he gets keep his nose all his life to the grindstone and die not worth a groat at last a fat kitchen makes a lean will as poor richard says and many estates are spent in the getting since women for tea forsook spinning and knitting and men for punch forsook hewing and splitting if you would be wealthy says he in another almanac think of saving as well as of getting the indies have not made spain rich because her outgoes are greater than her incomes away then with your expensive follies and you will not have so much cause to complain of hard times heavy taxes and chargeable families for as poor dick says women and wine game and deceit make the wealth small and the wants great and farther what maintains one vice would bring up two children you may think perhaps that a little tea or a little punch now and then diet a little more costly clothes a little finer and a little entertainment now and then can be no great matter but remember what poor richard says many a little makes a mickle and farther beware of little expenses a small leak will sink a great ship and again who dainties love shall beggars prove and moreover fools make feasts and wise men eat them here you are all got together at this vendue of fineries and knick-knacks you call them goods but if you do not take care they will prove evils to some of you you expect they will be sold cheap and perhaps they may for less than they cost but if you have no occasion for them they must be dear to you 
Remember what poor Richard says, Buy what thou hast no need of, and ere long thou shalt sell thy necessaries. And again, at a great pennyworth, pause a while. He means that perhaps the cheapness is apparent only and not real, or the bargain, by straightening thee in thy business, may do thee more harm than good. For in another place he says, Many have been ruined by buying good pennyworths. Again, poor Richard says, Tis foolish to lay our money in a purchase of repentance. And yet this folly is practised every day at vendues for want of minding the almanac. Wise men, as poor Dick says, learn by others' harms, fools scarcely by their own. But felix quem faciunt aliena pericula cautum, many a one for the sake of finery on the back have gone with a hungry belly, and half starved their families. Silks and satins, scarlet and velvets, as poor Richard says, put out the kitchen fire. These are not the necessaries of life, they can scarcely be called the conveniencies, and yet only because they look pretty, how many want to have them! The artificial wants of mankind thus become more numerous than the natural, and as poor Dick says, for one poor person there are an hundred indigent. By these and other extravagancies the genteel are reduced to poverty, and forced to borrow of those whom they formerly despised, but who through industry and frugality have maintained their standing. In which case it appears plainly that a ploughman on his legs is higher than a gentleman on his knees, as poor Richard says. Perhaps they have had a small estate left them, which they knew not the getting of. They think, "'Tis day, and will never be night, that a little to be spent out of so much is not worth minding." A child and a fool, as poor Richard says, imagine twenty shillings and twenty years can never be spent. But always taking out of the meal-tub, and never putting in, soon comes to the bottom. Then, as poor Dick says, when the wells dry they know the worth of water. But this they might have known before, if they had taken his advice. If you would know the value of money, go and try to borrow some. For he that goes a-borrowing goes a-sorrowing, and indeed so does he that lends to such people, when he goes to get it again. Poor Dick farther advises and says, Fond pride of dress is sure a very curse. Ere fancy you consult, consult your purse. And again, pride is as loud a beggar as want, and a great deal more saucy. When you have bought one fine thing, you must buy ten more, that your appearance may be all of a piece. But poor Dick says, "'Tis easier to suppress the first desire than to satisfy all that follow it, and tis as truly folly for the poor to ape the rich as for the frog to swell in order to equal the ox. Great estates may venture more, but little boats should keep near shore. Tis, however, a folly soon punished, for pride that dines on vanity sups on contempt, as poor Richard says, and in another place, pride breakfasted with plenty, dined with poverty, and supped with infamy. And after all, of what use is this pride of appearance, for which so much is risked, so much is suffered, it cannot promote health or ease pain, it makes no increase of merit in the person, it creates envy, it hastens misfortune. What is a butterfly? At best, he's but a caterpillar dressed. The gaudy fops his picture just, as poor Richard says. But what madness must it be to run in debt for these superfluities? We are offered, by the terms of this vendue, six months' credit, and that, perhaps, has induced some of us to attend it. Because we cannot spare the ready money, and hope now to be fine without it. But, ah, think what you do when you run in debt. You give to another power over your liberty. If you cannot pay at the time, you will be ashamed to see your creditor. You will be in fear when you speak to him. You will make poor, pitiful, sneaking excuses, and by degrees come to lose your veracity, and sink into base, downright lying. 
for as poor richard says the second vice is lying the first is running in debt and again to the same purpose lying rides upon debt's back whereas a free-born englishman ought not to be ashamed or afraid to see or speak to any man living but poverty often deprives a man of all spirit and virtue tis hard for an empty bag to stand upright as poor richard truly says what would you think of that prince or that government who should issue an edict forbidding you to dress like a gentleman or a gentlewoman on pain of imprisonment or servitude would you not say that you are free have a right to dress as you please and that such an edict would be a breach of your privileges and such a government tyrannical and yet you were about to put yourself under that tyranny when you run in debt for such dress your creditor has authority at his pleasure to deprive you of your liberty by confining you in jail for life or to sell you for a servant if you should not be able to pay him when you have got your bargain you may perhaps think little of payment but creditors poor richard tells us have better memories than debtors and in another place says creditors are a superstitious sect great observers of set days and times the day comes round before you are aware and the demand is made before you are prepared to satisfy it or if you bear your debt in mind the term which at first seemed so long will as it lessens appear extremely short time will seem to have added wings to his heels as well as shoulders those have a short lent saith poor richard who owe money to be paid at easter then since as he says the borrower is a slave to the lender and the debtor to the creditor disdain the chain preserve your freedom and maintain your independency be industrious and free be frugal and free at present perhaps you may think yourself in thriving circumstances and that you can bear a little extravagance without injury but for age and want save while you may no morning sun lasts a whole day as poor richard says gain may be temporary and uncertain but ever while you live expense is constant and certain and tis easier to build two chimneys than to keep one in fuel as poor richard says so rather go to bed supperless than rise in debt get what you can and what you get hold tis the stone that will turn all your lead into gold as poor richard says and when you have got the philosopher's stone sure you will no longer complain of bad times or the difficulty of paying taxes this doctrine my friends is reason and wisdom but after all do not depend too much upon your own industry and frugality and prudence though excellent things for they may all be blasted without the blessing of heaven and therefore ask that blessing humbly and be not uncharitable to those that at present seem to want it but comfort and help them remember job suffered and was afterwards prosperous and now to conclude experience keeps a dear school but fools will learn in no other and scarce in that for it is true we may give advice but we cannot give conduct as poor richard says however remember this they that won't be counselled can't be helped as poor richard says and farther that if you will not hear reason she'll surely wrap your knuckles thus the old gentleman ended his harangue the people heard it and approved the doctrine and immediately practised the contrary just as if it had been a common sermon for the vendue opened and they began to buy extravagantly notwithstanding all his cautions and their own fear of taxes i found the good man had thoroughly studied my almanacs and digested all i had dropped on those topics during the course of five and twenty years the frequent mention he made of me must have tired any one else but my vanity was wonderfully delighted with it though i was conscious that not a tenth part of the wisdom was my own which he ascribed to me but rather the gleanings i had made of the sense of all ages and nations however i resolved to be the better for the echo of it 
and though I had at first determined to buy stuff for a new coat, I went away resolved to wear my old one a little longer. Reader, if thou wilt do the same, thy profit will be as great as mine. I am, as ever, thine to serve thee, Richard Saunders, July 7th, 1757. End of The Way to Wealth by Benjamin Franklin